Good evening, everybody. We got that adjusted? My name's Mark Houston. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I was separated from uh, alcohol and cocaine the morning of October 19th of 1982 in Denver, Colorado. And uh, I'm grateful for that, and the world's a better place because of it. Uh, it was a tornado roaring through the lives of other people, and uh, I don't ever want to forget that. Uh, what a, uh, my home group is the Carry This Message group in Austin, Texas. We're a fundamental AA group. <laughs> Open to three minutes of meditation, and we have a chairperson, and uh, you can only bring up a topic out of the recovery portion of the big book. That's the doc's opinion through the first 164. And uh, if you can't talk for more than five minutes, we have a timer. If it goes off, we ask that you stop in mid-sentence. <coughs> Part of what we're about is, are you awake? Wake up. Get free of this idea because your eyes are open, you're awake. See? That almost killed me. But uh, small little group. I don't like big groups. I, got, I sobered up in Denver in small groups. I still like them today. And uh, we, uh, we laughed the other day. We did a group conscious two months ago, and we, we, most of the time we'd have between eight to ten people there, and someone said, well, the group's not going. We realized it's because we weren't telling anybody about it. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we had a huge turnout last month. We had 15 there. So we, but you know how we get. We're selfish people, right? So if you got something good, you, you want to keep it to yourself for a while. Uh, what an experience being down here. What a wonderful thing. I... I love Brad's story. See, that's how it is. That's how my life is. Uh, when I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, little coincidences here and there that begin to manifest. And uh, here's the other part in the equation. Some of you think you probably chose to be here. None of us chose to be here. We all made a decision in the third step. We offered ourselves to God to do with us as he willed, and he's got us here together, including me. And just to set the record straight versus this $2,000 that uh, Brad talked about, uh, <laughs> when, he, when he was asking about coming down, he said, well, by the way, there's a few other things. Uh, you're going to have to pay your own way. <laughs> of course, I didn't know at that time. That was about a $500 round-trip ticket. But he said, I'll do my best to find a place for you to stay. You're going to have to buy all your food and all the rest, you know, but... And I said, uh, okay, all right, let's do it. Let's come on down and have some, uh, have some fun, you know. Uh, what, a, what a great deal. Uh, one of the things I, I would like to do is to take a minute and um, I want to say a prayer for us, and I'll tell you why, whether you're brand new or whether you've been sober a long time. Biggest noose around your neck is the same one that's around mine, and that's what you think you know about what's going to happen here. And you bring it in your current belief systems and your dogma and your attachment to what you think you know. See, the truth is none of us have ever been together in this moment, in this time, so nobody here has a clue about what's going to happen. If I lose sight of that, what I take into all the meetings and when I'm working with somebody is my preconceived ideas about what's going to happen. Right? What I've learned over time through the disciplines of steps 10, 11, and 12 is to take a beginner's mind to everything, to everything. How do you walk back into your home group day after day, week after week, month after month, and stay plugged into that and stay open unless you have a beginner's mind and understand that, for example, all of you that belong to that home group when you were in there this evening, you've never been together this evening in that group. Therefore, you've never had that experience, right? Wake up, wake up to that, see? Never been in this moment before. See, I get a little slow in the uptake. Uh, some of you probably have read the book, Chuck Chamberlain, New Pair of Glasses. So I'm reading that book, and he's married to the same woman forever. And I don't know if there's any such thing as an enlightened people in the rooms of AA. I find that a little hard to believe. But <laughs> if there was, he's as close as there is. If you ever listen to his tapes and you read and you know anyone that knows him, that guy was devoid of self as far as I could tell. But I'm sitting here and I'm reading one day and he's talking about every morning he gets up and he's got a new woman sitting across from him. Now, I know he wasn't cheating on his wife. I knew he was talking about his wife. 
And I'm thinking, what does he mean by that? How can he be married to the same woman like it was 30, 40 years or something like that, but he wakes up every morning and there's a new woman there? What does he mean by that? About five years later, I finally got it. See, he was awake, and he realized that every morning when he woke up and he sat across from that woman, he had never been in that moment with that woman before. And I'll bet you that guy's life was juicy, baby. See, you, you get present, steps 10 to 11, this other work, if it swoops you into the present like it does me, I mean, I, Craig, here's the difference if you're sober for a while, you really work with the disciplines. He and I first get here on, on Thursday, and, and we're going for a walk, and he's got his head down just going like a chihuahua, baby, he's moving. Now, I'm a lot more awake, and I've never been here before, and I'm going in slow motion, and Cabo is swooping in, I mean, I can't even begin to handle it. He's turning around. What are you doing? Hurry up. And I go, whoa, man. You know, it's right out of a Cheech and Chong movie, you know. It's just, wow, did you see that? You know, and the colors, and whoa. The ocean away, whoa. You know, it's, it's bartender, I know he thinks I'm smoking reefer, you know. It's just, it's just sitting here, just looking, you know, and the people and the colors and just swoops in on you, you know. And every day it's like that. See, what an incredible... What a credible experience that is. Found my tribe. I was sent to you all. I call, I call the rooms of AA my tribe. I've been looking for a tribe, <laughs> and uh, I found one. And everywhere I go, you know, there, there we are. So let's take a minute, and if you'll uh, join me in a prayer. Uh, this prayer for me came out of We Agnostics. If you've done much work with that chapter, you might have an awareness that the word prejudice is used in there a lot, six, seven, eight, nine times, and they finally beg us to lay aside our prejudice. And if you look up the word prejudice, it means preconceived thought or opinion. So out of that is I begin to work with a prayer that I use whenever I go to meetings, where I'm sitting down to work with someone, whenever I'm going to go back through the steps again, and it goes something like this. Our Creator, we thank you for bringing us together in fellowship and love. We understand that we're joined together as a spiritual body, and there's so much more going on here than we realize. Help us to set aside everything we think we know about the big book, the 12 steps, the program, the fellowship, in all spiritual things, especially you, God, so I may have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help us see some new truth. Amen. Mm. I want to read something from uh, one of the books I'm currently working with. For you big book thumpers who think I'm doing something sacrilegious. The 11 step says, be quick to see where religious people are right. Make use of what they offer. And I do. 10th and 11 step gave me freedom to go out in the world and, and, and spend some time exploring all this incredible stuff out there. These books and Buddhism and monasteries and Christian mystics and all this neat, neat stuff. See, I do a lot of stuff in the 11th step along with, but never instead of. Some of you may know people like I. I've known people who like to do religious stuff instead of the rooms, and most of them, based on my experience, get drunk. So some of my teachers got real clear with me. You do this stuff along with not instead of, so I do. This is one of my teachers, a man named Anthony DeMell. It's called Awareness. It says on waking up. Spirituality means waking up. Most people, even though they don't know it, they are asleep. They're born asleep. They live asleep. They marry in their sleep. They breed children in their sleep. They die in their sleep without ever waking up. They never understand the loveliness and the beauty of this thing that we call human existence. All mystics, Catholic, Christian, non-Christian, no matter what their theology and no matter what their religion, are unanimous on one thing, that all is well. All is well. Though everything is a mess, all is well. Strange paradox, to be sure. But tragically, most people never get to see that all is well because they're asleep. They're having a nightmare. Waking up is unpleasant, you know. You're nice and comfortable in bed. It's irritating to be woken up. 
That's the reason the wise guru will not attempt to wake people up. I hope I'm going to be wise here and make no attempt whatsoever to wake you up if you're asleep. It's really none of my business, even though I say to you at times, wake up. My business is to do my thing to dance my dance. If you profit from it, fine. If you don't, too bad. As the Arabs say that nature rain is the same, but it makes thorns grow in the marsh and flowers in the garden. When I was brought into the, into the rooms in 1982, I had brain damage, kidney damage, and liver damage, and everything I owned fit in a duffel bag. And that's how I came to you. I ran it as long and as hard as I could. And alcohol was my master. I joke with uh, people I work with about if you don't want to do this, and I, I want to get clear with you all based on my experience what this is, and it's about a hell of a lot more than going to meetings, by the way. I tell them that, you know, why don't you just go ahead and build an altar to your drug of no choice. <laughs> Little play on words. I, I sit in meetings of AA and hear somebody say my drug of choice is alcohol, and I think to myself, well, then what are you doing in the rooms of AA? If your drug of choice is alcohol, choose not to drink it. If you're sitting in this room and you're an alky, your drug of no choice is alcohol. That's why you're in the rooms. My drug of choice is Excedrin. I buy it. I only take two. It sits in the cabinet for six to nine months. I don't mortgage the house and lose a relationship because of Excedrin. That's a drug of choice. Alcohol is my drug of no choice which is why a lot of these slogans that you hear, which, by the way, are not in the book, things like, just don't drink, no matter what. Well, no matter what I drink. <laughs> just don't drink, even if your ass falls off. My ass even hits have fallen off, I used to drink. But uh, later I found out none of that's in my book. That Those terms refer to expressions of people who are not like me, because I'm a real alcoholic. You know, earlier uh, this evening, there was a lady that was talking about, she was hoping she could remember the shame and remorse behind her drinking to keep her sober. And I don't know about you, but I can't. Book's very clear, I can't. Consequences have never kept me, never kept me from drinking, ever. That's what it means to be a real alcoholic, where you've lost the power of choice. And I was separated from alcohol, and, and my story is not one of coming in and out of the rooms, by the way. Uh, I was that tornado. Uh, I roared through relationships, been married and divorced four times, engaged six times. <laughs> well, toward the end, see, I couldn't do very well at supporting myself. Somebody had to. So... See, nice alcoholics scare me. See, it's inconsistent with the big book, right? It says the root of my problem is I'm selfish and self-centered. I'm like a tornado roaring through the lives of others. They don't want to come in the room and pretend I'm nice. There's not a room full of nice people when we get here. Do we get changed and transformed? Absolutely. What's the promise? I have a psychic change. I have a revolutionary spiritual experience. Then as far as I can tell, I get to improve and grow using the spiritual disciplines of the 10th and 11th step. Strict spiritual discipline, by the way. Strict spiritual disciplines. I want to take a moment and tell you my current experience. Some of you have been sober for a while. By the way, I, one of the things that I hope I get to do this evening and in the next two evenings is to disturb some of you about the question of alcoholism which in the chapter working with others says it's a good thing if I do that, right? Because maybe if you'll get disturbed, you may or may not change your course of action, but particularly this is for people who've been sober for a while. You find yourself saying this very often, you're probably headed for trouble. Well, when I came in, and when I came in, and when I came in, just like my body can't live off the food I ate two weeks ago, you can't live off that experience. It's deadly. I got a guy at my rehab right now. It had 23 years. When I came in, when I, and I started asking him, 
So he picked up a drink. He drank for two years straight. Spent almost two months in a VA hospital because he had drank himself almost into a wet brain. So now his head's clear, and I get to talking to him. He hadn't done anything with the steps in years, hadn't touched inventory, wasn't doing anything with the disciplines of 10, 11, living off an old experience. And he picked up a drink. I don't know if he'll ever come back. So what's my current experience? Every morning that I have been down here, I get up, and after a little coffee, I open my big book to Upon Awakening. And I read, and I say all of those prayers out of my big book. And then I have a timer, and I'm doing a 10-minute meditation, and I do that meditation. Then all through the day, I work with the 10-step tools. What do I mean by 10-step tools? There's all kinds of them. Ask, turn, cease, sixth sense, how can I best serve thee? Thy will not mine be done. Eleven step tool, pause when agitated or doubtful. Many times throughout the day, thy will be done. And then when Craig and I go back and we're sitting in our room tonight, we're going to go to the big book and we're going to do our evening review and we're going to answer all those questions about our day. And I do all this, ladies and gentlemen, for one reason. The only reason I'm standing here up here sober, if you believe the book, and I do, is because I'm in fit spiritual condition, and those are the things that keep Mark Houston in fit spiritual condition. Not God. Is God a part of all that? Yes. If staying sober was about God, this book would be one page. It'd say, God keeps you sober. Have a great day. <laughs> but I find this book to be full of action, which I have to take. See, an easier, softer way would be God keeps us sober, wouldn't it? No work associated with that. See? So, I'll, I'll just throw this out, a little something for you all to chew on. Um, if you want to know what you believe in, look at your actions. So, I just described what the big book is very, very clear on how Mark stays in fit spiritual condition. So all of you take some time and just sit and look and just take the last seven days and ask yourself, did you do what this book says to do in steps 10 and 11? And if the answer is no, then I think you need to sit with a question. And here's the question. Are you assuming you're in fit spiritual condition because you've been sober for a while? Right? Are you assuming that? Are you living off an old experience? Does just going to a meeting keep you in fit spiritual condition? See? Whenever I write inventory, I want to know what I'm up against. I always look at my actions, what the things I'm doing or not doing, and then I look at the subsequent belief system. So, for example, if you're not doing evening review, what do you think the belief system is? Anybody. Yeah, you don't need it. I'm okay. I don't need to do evening review for fit spiritual condition, but this book's real clear on that. Is it not? Right? If you're not doing upon awakening and doing saying those prayers and doing some meditation, what's the belief system? It says, it says upon awakening, we consider our plans for the day. It goes through all kinds of prayers, right? So what do you think the belief system is? I don't have to do it, and I'm okay. Right? As far as I can tell, my book says I'm given a data reprieve contingent on one thing and one thing only, my fit spiritual condition. Now, let me tell you some reasons why I'm so adamant about this. I've worked in the field of chemical dependency now for 18 years, and I've buried a lot of people. And they used to die in their rooms, and they're still dying, but they ain't dying in the rooms no more. They're going to these hospitals and rehabs. Then they're dying. They used to die in the rooms. I sobered up in Denver, Colorado my third year. I remember... 90 days, 14 people drank themselves to death. That used to happen in our rooms. Now that doesn't happen in our rooms, and there's a real subtle thing going on. You know what it is? If I relapse, I'll make it back. That is not my experience. Between my ninth and 10th year, because I wasn't doing the things that I'm sharing with you that I now do, I wound up in an insane asylum in Houston, Texas. Spent 45 days there, almost committed suicide. My mind, sober, drive mo drove me wacko. <laughs> Some of you can relate to that. They wanted to assign all kinds of other labels to why I was in that place. 
But I know why I was in that place. I was dying of untreated alcoholism, period. Stone cold say we're going to a lot of meetings, living off an old experience, dying inside from the disease of untreated alcoholism. You know, as far as I can tell, I'm either growing or I'm going. And there is nothing in between for a guy like me. I got to come at my spiritual life the same way I came at vodka. And I was a mad dog. I didn't care about anybody or anything. And I did worship vodka. And I mean that. And if you're sitting here, the same is probably true for you. Do we sit and say, oh, I love my children? Really? Did they go to rehab with you? No, you didn't. See, I... You, all you got to do, look at your actions as to what you love. As far as I can tell, there's three things I have deeply loved in my life. Myself, vodka, and God. And everything else just fits somewhere in there. <laughs> 20 years, booze. Booze, altar, worship at the altar of booze. You know why I know that? I broke the hearts of every human being who ever cared about me because I, I went where... Booze told me to go. I may as well got up every morning and said, oh, King Alcohol. <laughs> Name of the, right? Do with me as you wish. Because it did. Right? Alcohol didn't care about those wives I had who I loved. I'm not a bad man. I was born and raised in, in Iowa. I was raised with good values, Norwegian people. I know the difference between right and wrong. I know what it's like to honor a relationship. And I took a drink of booze. You think booze cares about that? Not hardly. She looks good. <laughs> you think booze cares about career? I don't think so. They won't find out. Right? Propitious creditor was the term. But I really realized one time in reading the big book that alcohol was my master, and I got that. I got what I worshipped at the throne at. And then I had those first nine, nine and a half years. And don't get me wrong, I had some good years in there. But I rested my laurels and I lived off an old experience. And if I could save anybody in this room that experience, I'll do it. So I'm tired of burying alkies, particularly alkies who get some time and pick up a drink. Because what you're up against is the progressive nature of alcoholism. And if you think you're sitting in this room and you get 10 years and pick up a drink, it's like before then, you are wrong. You're up against yourself. Big time. Drank for 20 years. Got separated from alcohol by this power, this God. Along the way, I got drafted. I spent 13 and a half months in Vietnam. A period of years, went in the corporate world. I drank all that up. Had a couple of brothers back in Colorado. They were entrepreneurs in the drug dealing business. Since my resume no longer fit other places, I decided to join forces with them, so I did that for a couple of years. That's not what I went to college to learn, by the way, but uh, alcoholism turned me into something I'm not. But it became a normal way of life. I can't separate the true from the false. I think it's normal to carry a gun in the boot and drink and fight and chase women, and act almost sociopathic. Matter of fact, when I, when I had my first real first step experience, I got excited to finally found out what was wrong with me, which was I was an alcoholic with a craving of the body and obsession of the mind. The reason I was excited, it finally gave me an answer to behavior that looked very sociopathic, psychopathic. <laughs> and I don't know if you know, but you can't treat the, either one of those conditions. So when I found out, and I can give you a lot of examples. I'm living with a gal in Denver, Colorado. She has a young child. I go to the store to get milk. I go to Bennigan's. I take a drink. Seven days later, I wake up at a mobile home in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which is 800 miles away. That was not where I planned on going when I left Aurora, Colorado. And then it's weird because I didn't have a clue where I was. And I'm looking out this window, and there's this woman. I've never seen her before. None of this landscape looks familiar, and I, she has mail there, and I see I'm in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. No recall of how I got here. And I had stuff like that happen hundreds of times. 
I'm up in Alaska. My grandmother dies. I want to go to a funeral, and I get on the plane. Six days later, I wake up in a hotel in St. Louis. Missed the funeral. Didn't want to miss the funeral. I wanted to be there. I loved that woman, and I didn't know why. And you have that stuff happen enough. At some point in time, you really start asking yourself some questions about what is wrong with me. And that big book said, I'll tell you what's wrong with you. Mark, when you take a drink, it takes you. Wow. That's right. That line in there, it explains many things for which Mark could not otherwise account. Wow. What a great thing. Now I know why I did that. That didn't make me any feel better about it, but at least I had an explanation, right? See, that incredible first step experience. First 33 pages of the big book are divided to asking one question. When I take a drink, do I lose power, choice, and control over how much? Period. Every year I rework the first nine steps. I'll tell you why. Because I fall asleep sometimes. I'll do my evening review. Craig and I did it last night. Were you resentful? Yes. Now here's what I haven't done. I did have a resentment last night. I haven't written a four column inventory on it yet though and I haven't done a fifth step and I haven't done six and seven and eight. And what will happen in the course of a year's time is I have this stage character I call the spiritual man that likes to think he's so evolved he hardly ever gets resentful. He's such a good member of AA. And uh, he shows up sometimes and, you know, oh, you don't, you, you don't resent him, Mark. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so once a year, I always find a... a, a a bunch of resentments I need to write on. So January of every year, I take a look at, uh, you know, some of you may even want to consider doing this. I take a look at what I call my current unmanageability. Here's what I mean by that. Remember I told you, I'm not interested in when I came in. I'm not interested in last year. Everyone in this room, you have some current, uh, current unmanageability. You have some current spiritual malady stuff. It might be your health. It might be finances. It might be relationships. It might be illness. It could be a host of things. It might be grief. It might be sadness. But you, everyone in this room, you've got some current unmanageability, I assure you. That's the stuff we're going to get drunk over, ladies and gentlemen. It's not the stuff from back here, back when. And unless some of you become enlightened between now and then, it bothers you. Every one of you in the past week have had the same fears cycling through your mind, that interior dialogue. So I make a list of my current unmanageability. I'll give you an example of some of mine. One of them is my physical body. Currently not smoking, thank God. <laughs> it's been a, been a tough one. Serious addiction to nicotine. I, I want to develop a lifestyle for the next 30 years of my life and smoking two packs of Marlboro Reds a day doesn't fit that, if you know what I mean. Is that something I can drink over? Yeah, I got a guy, a pal of mine I've known for 10 years. One time he wanted to be a monk. Got throat cancer. Seven years sobriety, went on a rip-roaring drunk. Drank for two months, just got through doing chemo, two months of chemo. Had to bring him down into my rehab. Can you drink behind the illness? You bet you can. Current unmanageability. Here's another area, current unmanageability. I call it time slash people balance. Started a new business 19 months ago. Got 27 employees already. They need my time. They're like little piranhas. <laughs> then I got sponsees like Craig. <laughs> See, he, I, I appreciate his honesty. He told you, he, he, nine years sober. I'm on a trip. Not even, hi, how was it? About me, about me, about me, about me, about me, right? 
And I got five, just like him. <laughs> Get them together, it sounds like a convention of old women. <laughs> Noise level off the charts, right? See? So in addition to all these employees, I got five protégés like that. And I get asked to go around and do stuff like that. I only do six of these things a year. Uh, I had to laugh when I, I don't know what a circuit speaker is. I always think of some guy riding a jackass somewhere when I hear that. But, you know, <laughs> the, the, the most I can do with you is share my experience and, and, and share with you some things that I do. And out of that, if you find some stuff you can do and have your experience there was time well spent. That's all. Um, if you ever listen to my stuff, trust me, it changes all the time. And the reason it changes, I'm always doing my work. My work. That experience in the nut house caught my attention. You know the one that I was resting on my laurels? <laughs> I don't care to go there again. I had great insurance and they had a key. <laughs> I pulled a jack, one flew over the cuckoo nest. It was yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Anything to get out of there. Boy, I had to fake wellness. <laughs> See, we're not well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> tribe I belong to, we're not well. We'll always be on the fringes. Our heads do not look at things right. One of the reasons I, I love Anthony DeMello, I'm reading his book, and he says in there, I want to write a book. And the title of the book is, I'm an ass, you're an ass, and it's okay that we're both asses. And I thought, that describes the rooms of AA. See, it's just, here. By the way, if, if you're new, I want to help you with something. You're never going to get well. Now, you'll stay sober and have a lot of fun, but you will not get well. I'll sit at home, do my morning disciplines, do my prayer, my meditation. Got my cat hobo there. Just chilling out. Man, I'm all hooked up. I'm a little sunbeam for God. Then I put my hand on the door, and it's on. <laughs> Go out and get my GMC Yukon, and my head's already, who's going to get in front of me now? <laughs> Six o'clock, and I want to go through Starbucks, and I got a little old blue-haired lady in front of me. <laughs> Just had this great love of God in my heart. This voice says, if she don't speed up, I'm going to ram her. <laughs> See, that's not right. But that's me. That's your speaker. The difference between me and a lot of folks, I don't pretend I'm well. See? We I tell all the guys I work with, you know, don't be laying that well stuff out on me, right? See? But you have a lot of fun with it. Have a lot of fun with it. God, I don't know what I'd do without this program. I remember 15 years sober one time going to a grocery store. I'm sitting up getting ready to go inside, and this fear, this overwhelming fear begins to crowd through my body. It's like, okay, what's going on here? I'm afraid to go in the grocery store, so I had the voice. I had the dialogue. You know the dialogue we have with ourselves all day long, the voices, right? What are you afraid of? Well, somebody might say hi and look you in the eye. Well, that ain't that big a deal. Yeah, it is, right? And the voice is going, 15 years sober. I don't know how old I was then, but, and I, I'm afraid to go into a grocery store, for God's sakes, to buy groceries. So I say a prayer, and then I feel okay, and then I go in. Realizing, I, I have my own opinion about this. I, I have a feeling that, I don't know if there's such a thing in reincarnation or how it is all this stuff happens, but I, I like to work with visuals, and I sometimes think that God and St. Peter, when we came down the pike, were playing poker. And they just like, and there's certain things we were supposed to come down here with. And because they were playing poker and not paying attention, we got past them without it. God says, oh, God, we missed a few. They'll become Elkies. See, because I was never comfortable until I had that drink. Then I was okay. See, it's felt like, it always has felt like I straddled the world, straddled both sides. And what I finally came to realize, I, when the book says no middle-of-the-road solution, I either need a lot of whiskey or I need a lot of God, period. 
I can't straddle anymore. And uh, I'll bitch to God about that when I get up there. I don't think that's quite right. But that is the truth. I never felt a part of until I took a drink when I was 16 years old. Then I had that experience sober, what I called middle of the road, middle of the road in sobriety, see? Trust me, ladies and gentlemen, if just going to meetings and not drinking worked for me, I'd do it. I really would, you know? I'm not going to sit here and tell you I love, you know, when I'm in Austin, Texas, Monday through Friday, between 4 and 4.15, my alarm clock goes off and my feet are on the floor. Do I like doing that? No. No. Why do I do that? I do because I like the effect produced and I want to stay in fit spiritual condition. And I don't want to ever take a drink of alcohol again. Because when I take a drink, the drink takes me and all bets are off and I lose all rights. That's why. That's why I do it. I don't do it to be a nice guy. None of that. I do it because the book says if you do this, I can promise you some great stuff. An awakened sixth sense. An awakened spirit. The ability to grow and understand and effectiveness. You will have recovered and been given the power to help others. Amazing stuff. You'll walk hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Wow. Cheats and Chong stuff. You know? Yeah. Which, by the way, stuff we don't talk enough about in our meetings. I hope when I leave here, I'll stir up what you bring up for a topic. For example, went to a couple of meetings down here. Everybody have a topic, and I almost did this. I didn't, but... Maybe I will. Yes, I'd like you to share your experience with your new sixth sense. That's in the tenth step, by the way. Do the work in the first nine. Face and be rid of that which has you blocked from power. You get to the tenth step and the eleventh step and start working those disciplines. You do have a new sixth sense. It's called your spirit, your awakened spirit. You start to go through your day and your life letting that awakened spirit guide you and move you. Fabulous stuff. What's your experience with having entered the world of the spirit? That's in the 10th step, too. Now, you ever heard that as a topic? Why aren't we talking about this stuff? Power. This program's about power. It tells you that in we agnostics. The whole purpose of this program is to enable you to develop a relationship with the power which will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Why aren't we talking about power? Elkies love power. It is. It's a power. How about right in the middle of fear inventory? This is another topic you'll never hear. It says, I'm going to let God demonstrate through me what God can do. Why aren't we talking about that? Why are we talking about what it's like to let God demonstrate through you what God can do? A couple of people say to me, well, what preparation do you do for this? And I said, nothing. Except the work in 1 through 9 of the disciplines of 10 and 11. I'm a hollow bone. I've done the work necessary to let God demonstrate through me what God can do. See, I don't have a clue what you need, but God does. So if you have any problems with anything that comes out of this mouth, it's not my fault. <laughs> but see, all this is in this book. Credible stuff. Oh, just don't drink, go to meetings. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. A life beyond your wildest dreams. Rocket scientist stuff. Great stuff. See? You wake up to all that, you take that into your life. Take that into your relationships. Take that into your careers. Take that into every area of your life. Take that kind of power. We agnostics, be an intelligent agent, spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. What does that mean? Well, I think it means intelligent agent, spearhead of God's ever-advancing creation. See? All my troubles are my own making. Most powerful, one of the most powerful statements of hope in the big book. Why, why would I say that? Why do you think I would say that? Big book says, all my troubles are my own making. Why is that a great thing? What if your troubles are of somebody else's making? They got to change in order for you to get well. Right? I've done a lot of work with the fourth step, fourth and fifth steps. Matter of fact, I got some inventory. I'll be reading some of it, two or three pieces. While I'm down here, I read that to the men I work with. I'm accountable. See? If you get your sense of self outside yourself, you're in trouble.
Because then something outside you has got to change, get better in order for you to be okay. It's a horrible way to live. I get my sense of self right here. You can add to me, but you can't take nothing from me. Do you hear what I just said? See, because all my troubles are my own making. Everything in my life is on loan. It's all a gift. It's on loan. Living in a world of impermanence. Don't know how long it's on loan. And if it turns to me one day and says, I'm gone, God bless you. Go in peace. Turn to the next one. What a great way to live. From that position, you can love. All my troubles are my own making. Wow. What amazing stuff. I spent years drinking because my troubles were of your making. And I'm trying to arrange my life. If Mark's arrangements would only stay put. If only people would do as Mark wished, the show would be great. Right? Listen to some gentlemen read some inventory today. Probably tomorrow night. I want to spend some time talking about the fourth and fifth step. My experience over the years, and I've worked with a lot of people, a lot of varying links. Right now, I, I, uh, I'm sponsoring a woman. She's 44 years sober. Been sponsoring her for 10 years. When she came to me, she was one of the doing a lot of speaking, yada, yada, yada. Nobody would say anything to her, and she was dying of untreated alcoholism. She almost committed suicide. Alone with the most sobriety. She heard a tape when I talked about almost taking myself out of here. She called me. Took her through the steps, right in inventory. Tell you, doing a fifth step with somebody that long sober and I got less time was like dancing with the devil. <laughs> Unbelievable. Pulled her free of that. Pulled her free of that. Incredible. Woman's in her 80s and more vibrant and alive than anyone I know. Fabulous stuff. Doesn't matter how long you're sober, you get trapped by this stuff. See? I want to talk more about the fourth and the fifth step. What that's about. I believe in writing a lot with inventory. Why? Because my ego is as mysterious and powerful as God himself as far as I'm concerned. And I can't defeat my ego. It takes the best of us. So that's why you do fourth and fifth step. I started to tell you my, my current reality. I mentioned the unmanageability. But you might consider this as an exercise. Is make a list of your own current unmanageability. The stuff that's rubbing up against you. Make a list of your current fears. I'm not talking old stuff. I'm not talking like the fear inventory itself. But all of us in this room, I would say in the last week or two, you have reoccurring fears running through your mind, don't you? That list may be six, seven, eight of them. That's what's rubbing up against you today. Then you walk into the meeting, they say, how you doing? You go, I'm just fine. <laughs> Wake up. On the one hand, you are. On the other, you're not. Right? See, I had uh, nine fears. 10.30 at night, no one's around. Finish the evening review, all hooked up. And this voice, you'll never quit smoking. You'll die a horrible death. Have a good night. <laughs> see, see? <laughs> y'all, what? Y'all know what I mean about them voices, right? You. <clears throat> we'll have a little fun. I want to introduce you to your host of characters, if I can. This morning, when you all got up, within about five or ten minutes, imagine that you had a table. Imagine there's chairs. And you all had internal dialogue going on this morning, right? The voices? Some of you perhaps think that is a singular voice. It is not. I'll introduce you to my voices. You can identify your own. The voices are a combination of the different things you have going in your life that you think identify who and what you are. So, here's some of mine. We have the spiritual guy. We have Mr. AA. Those are two different guys, by the way. 
Mr. AA, if you don't follow the group conscious, he's going to be in your face. The spiritual guy, he's all forgiving. <laughs> Different guys. We have the jock, right? Got a jock in me. We have, uh, we have the present owner of my company. He's in there. We have the sponsor. We have the pal. We have the boyfriend. We have the author. I've always had a Rambo in me. He's in there. <laughs> and I would say for the most part, that's pretty well my host of characters. And all those, are, all those different identities, well, as you well know, if you walk up to somebody and just meet somebody, what's the second or third thing out of your mouth? What do you ask them? What do you do? Like that has anything to do with anything, but... We're all asleep, dreaming we're awake, so we just do that. What do you do? You know? By the way, if you want to mess with people in that area, just look at them and say, I breathe, and you? They don't know where to go with it. But here's what happened this morning. I get up. Oh, there's, obviously, there's a caffeine addict in there because he says, get the coffee going. So I, I'm not smoking, so I didn't have to listen to Nicotine Man. Oh, I got it. I've been up against, I've been up against a new guy. I'm, I got this guy with me. He's on vacation. So the A guy says, "Well, you're going to give a talk tonight, so you know you got to do the disciplines. Otherwise, you're a goddamn liar." <laughs> so get the big book open. The guy on vacation says, "No, we've got a hundred pages left in that novel. Damn it, we're on vacation. We want to read now." I haven't even used the bathroom. Right? Walk ten feet. Jock, we're gonna work out. We gotta work out. If we don't work out, you're gonna get fat. <laughs> now I get over at the coffee pot and I'm making the coffee. You know, spiritual man. Oh, isn't this fantastic? <laughs> Boyfriend, he had some shit to say. Just incredible. Just <clears throat> and those. See, I have fun with all this. But there was a time that I, at all those voices and all those identities, I really thought was me. Let me explain the problem with that. That's where all your inventory comes from. Any of those, for example, I'll give you some example. Let's say that in my, in my last inventory, I wrote on three past employees. So if you have a, a businessman and you're an owner of a company, what does he need to be to exist? He needs a company. He needs the company to be successful. So anything that happens that hurts, threatens, or interferes with that, he's fighting for his life. So he wrote inventory. I had a couple of my friends who didn't do what I wanted. So the friend wrote inventory. A couple of my sponsees didn't do what I wanted. The sponsor wrote inventory. What's a sponsor need to be to exist? Need sponsees that toe the line. Right? See, now I have a lot of fun with this, but I got to tell you, there were at, at, at one time, you know, there, there's another book that said, Wear the World Like a Loose Garment. I really know what that means. I live in a world of impermanence. I'm in the world to play the role of God has signed, but I don't get attached to the role because it could end just like that. I've listened to some fifth steps lately. The, the one in particular is this, this relationship dynamic where a relationship ends. So imagine, you're, imagine the, the, the role that you're in is on Broadway. Show's over. Guess what we do? We go back to the theater. No one there but us. <laughs> Nobody's coming in. No other stage characters. Then we bring that into the meetings and we share with them about the old movie we used to be in, right? <clears throat> no reality to it anymore. But we give it, except what we give it. You see what I'm saying? I do a thing I call theater of lie. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I want to spend some time with you on this is at somewhere around that nine, nine and a half years when I had gone to, to work, when I got sober, I went to work for a company working 60, 70, 80 hours a week sometimes. And that job ended a year later because most of my identity came from that job. I almost committed suicide behind that 
because my identity was tied into it. How many of you have had relationships end and, and had a broken heart? Well, you know why? If you're getting your identity through the relationship. See, what, is a re what do you need? What, what does a boyfriend need to be to exist? Needs a girlfriend. Girlfriend says, thanks, we're done. <laughs> Peels off. She didn't just break up. She said he doesn't exist. He's fighting for his life. Big book says, in that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancy or real, has the power to kill. This is real stuff. This is the tragedy of the ego. But I have fun with it, like Craig and I, right? You know, Craig will say, oh, I'm mad. I'll say, who's mad? Which stage character's mad? You see, you start to have fun with yourself. Quit taking yourself so seriously. See? Like Brad, he has a penchant for drama sometimes. <laughs> See? Like you guys brought that up. I said, what? He was actually late for a meeting. Can you imagine what Mr. AA said to him? <laughs> Can you imagine what that voice said? You SOB, you've been telling people for years never be late for a meeting, and now you're late. You just gave them carte blanche to be late all the time, you idiot. <laughs> all your teachings are gone in the week of one eye. <laughs> and that's after we looked at him and said, how you doing? He said, oh, just great, you. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven forbid a sponsee come up and said, well, I think I need to end this relationship. See, what's because what's it? What's the sponsor need to be to exist? Need sponsees, right? Fighting for my life, see? You can't. It's a horrible way to go through life. How are we doing on time on the uh, recording? Hello? Time? Say what? 10 minutes? 20 minutes. Okay. All right. I don't want to go over. Brad City would shoot me if I did. So, let's go back to this. Look at your current unmanageability. See if there's fears that you're up against. Current stuff, not old stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Current, current. Right? Get current with your life. Then you get to take that into Chapter 2, We Agnostics. Here's another little list you could make. Make a list of your current agnosticism. Some believer's sphincter muscle just went, bonk, bonk. What do you think I mean by current agnosticism? What do you think I mean by that? Any speculations? Bingo. Where God isn't. One hint would be those fears. There's no God. Current agnosticism. God and agnosticism cannot exist in the same space. By the way, don't fall for this. Some of you, I'll bet, think because you tell me you believe in God, you do. Here's the valid question. Are you living your life as though you believe in God? Hmm. See, the ego will tr the, your ego will trick you, your mind, right? I love Eckhart Tolle's definition of ego. A mind-made false sense of self. Where my mind tells me where I'm getting my sense of self from. And one of the great tricks is I tell you that I believe in God. See? We agnostics gets real clear that this is about knowing God. This is about gaining access to God. This is about an experience with God and has little or nothing to do with believing in God. What a, what a great gift we're given through this process of the steps. And it's not belief, it's knowing. It's a revolutionary spiritual experience. Make the hair in the back of your head stand up. Knowing God, big difference, huge difference. So when I go back through the steps again, I take a look at my current agnosticism. Because if I got some, you all got some. And I look at my fears, and I look at some of that unmanageability, and I bring it into the second step again. 
two parts to that second step. Am I willing to believe there's a power greater than myself that can take me past here? Here. You all understand what I mean when I say here? Everything I think I know, all my belief systems, all my experiences, is there more past here? Are there dimensions of joy, wonder, love, service, pain, that I know nothing about. Am I willing to believe that? Yes, otherwise God is finite. Yes, I'm willing to believe I can be taken past here into dimensions I know nothing about, into experiences I know nothing about. I'm willing to go for that. Yes. I love we agnostics. Don't try and, de don't try and define or comprehend the power. Today I have no concept of God. I was stripped of it. It's like a wave's a part of the ocean. It has all the properties of the ocean, but it's not the ocean. That's kind of like how I feel I am with God. I have all the properties of God, but I'm not God. Yet I have all the properties. And beyond that, I don't know how do we explain it. But all is well in my world, always. All is well, even if it's a mess. All is well. I distinguish between my life and my life circumstances. Stay hooked up and awake to your life. Take that into an ever-changing life circumstances, this world of impermanence, which we hate because we're fear-based. That sense of conscious separation Chuck C. used to talk about. The more you feel separated from your true self, God and others, the more you will be afraid. That's how you'll go through life. No authenticity to that. No authenticity. Your insides and outsides do not match. Big Book talks about we present to the world our stage character. Right? Second step, another piece. Faced with a self-imposed crisis. Here's my self-imposed crisis. I'm in my 26th year. I'm up against me. That's my self-imposed crisis. I can no longer postpone or evade. I had to fearlessly face the proposition. God is everything. I'm going to place all this under God. Again, all this new stuff. What is my choice to be? And I sit with that. I sit with that. And then I make that choice. I'm going to do it. Now that choice for me is going to thrust me into my third step. Been sober for a while. There's a great exercise. You get done with the ABCs and you're starting to look at your third step. There's a requirement you and I have to meet before we make our third step decision. You know what that is? Am I convinced that my life, 26 years sober, ran on my will, cannot and will not work? Stop and you sit with that. And I like to take a look at where I'm trying to run my life and my will. If any of you are struggling with that, just ask some of your friends. They'll help you. <laughs> or your significant other. Listen, honey, I'm <clears throat> 25 years sober. I just thought I'd ask you a little question. I, I'm sure you don't have much to say, but I, I'm examining whether or not I might be running any areas of my life on self-will. You know and, if they say pull out a notebook, you know you're, you're in delusion, right? But you can sit and look at that, and you can test that. I did that. Ask a few of my employees. They said, yeah, yeah, you can be that way at times. Okay. Ask some of my pals. Yeah. Okay. Get it? And then the book spends a page and a half describing what it looks like when you and I run our life on our will. If our arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as I wished, by the way, do as I wish also means how you act. Okay. When I listen to fifth steps and when I read inventory, visualizations work well for me. And when I'm working with this third step stuff and fourth and fifth step, I like to imagine myself in a little amphitheater like this. And it's bowl-shaped. 
and then at the front is a stage, and there's this big throne chair, and my ass is parked in it. And all the people that are in my life are sitting in this amphitheater. And I can see them. And if my arrangements would only stay put, if only Craig would do as I wished, and Brad would do, boom. And I have these scripts for you, the way I need you to act in order for me to be okay. Now, unfortunately, I don't give them to you. You are to read my mind. And I'm going to get my complete sense of self from scripts I've never given you. It's just amazing. Now I'm going to get upset because you did not read my mind. Maybe you were a little short when, in fact, I needed all of your attention that moment to feel good about myself. You didn't give it to me. You know, it's just amazing. And you sit and you look at that and you go, oh, my God, what a horrible way to live. I'm getting my entire sense of self from all these people that I have no control over. Waking up to that will get your sphincter muscle moving. Seriously. Most people, when I start working with them, have no idea they're placing their, their entire life. Well, here's how it looks. It'd be like, it'd be like uh, say, let's say that Brad was that way, right? Then if I wanted to know how Brad was feeling, I would just call all of his friends. I wouldn't even have to bother calling Brad. I just call his friends, say, Robert, how are you doing today? I want to know how Brad's doing. Why are you calling me? Well, because if you're not doing well, Brad won't be doing well. <laughs> Don't even need to bother talking to Brad. See? We've all done that, haven't we? Right? Till I got free of this, hell, that last marriage I was in, if you wanted to know how I was doing, all you had to do was call Carla. Say, how you doing, Carla? Not good. Thanks. I'm going to stay away from Mark. <laughs> See, I didn't set out to live that way. I didn't. I was asleep, dreaming I was awake. Had no idea that was going on. Given all my power to everything out here. Employers and her and blah, 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 blah. It got sick behind that. A lot of suffering behind that and realized God never intended me to live that way and I was asleep to something, and what was it? And by God, I started to wake up. And I took my power back. And I did that to a lot of inventories. Some outside books from spiritual teachers, like the 11 step tells us to look at. I still remember the day my entire sense of self was derived from the inside out, and I got free. That day, I could truly love you. You know why? Because you don't need to do anything for me to be just fine. And I'm just here to give, 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 and I don't need anything from you. And then the paradox of the whole thing is, when you get to that place and don't need anything, you got more coming at you and you know what to do with. But as long as I need it, I can't have it. Wow. And everything's on loan, and boy, I get that. And when you get that, you don't take anything for granted anymore. You don't take pals for granted. You don't take relationships. You don't take your hell. You don't take anything. You know, how, you know how freeing it is to, to not have to go through the day and that day being determined by someone else's behavior? Wow. What a great thing. That happens with a lot of work with the fourth and fifth step, ladies and gentlemen. But go back to your own little amphitheater. What are you trying to arrange? My arrangements would only stay put if they only do as I wished. They only elect a Democrat this time. It's just crazy stuff. They changed the immigration law. It's just wacko stuff. If she would only behave, you know, if they'd only give me more money, if I could only sell more, yet all this is out here controlling how you're feeling, how you experience yourself. See, all I ever wanted was happiness. Well, as long as it's out there, you'll never have it. All that does is guarantee that you'll be fear-based your entire life. Right? Wow. Wow. You start to look at what it looks like when you're living a life based on self-will. See, a life based on self-will is always externally driven. It's not internally driven. It's externally driven. So the extent to which something outside yourself will determine how you experience yourself is the extent to which you're living a life driven by self-will. Damn, that was good. I've never said that before. <laughs> 
Then the book takes you over to finally describe what's wrong with us. Selfishness, self-centers is the root of my troubles. When I experienced myself in that setting that I told you about, here's what happens. Where I'm getting my sense of self out here. Book says, when that goes on, I will be driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking. I mean, I'm going to look at all you, particularly when you're not doing what I want, and I'm going to pick one of those tools, fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, self-seeking, and I'm going to use that tool to attempt to coerce you to change so I'm okay. So I go through life being driven by a hundred forms, and as a result of that, here's what I do. I step on the toes of my fellows, column one, and they retaliate, column two, and they hurt me, column three. But the book goes on to say, at some point in time in the past, no, it says invariably, which means every time, I made a decision based on me, which later placed me in a position to be hurt. I truly do create my reality. And that is a wonderful thing. And then it follows that with all my troubles are my own making. If you don't get that, you can't get free. See, I'm so glad I know that. All my troubles are my own making. Nobody else's. Okay. And then a couple of other lines, which we also don't discuss in meetings. It says, it doesn't say quit drinking at this point. You know what the book says? Matter of fact, as far as I can tell, past page 23, the book doesn't talk to you and I about drinking. The reason is simple. If I never have an obsession of the mind to convince me to take a drink, I'll never experience a phenomenon of craving. Therefore, my main problem centers in my mind. Unfortunately, I need a spiritual solution to treat the main problem centers of the mind. That's why very little of the big book is occupied with drinking, because that's not the problem. Matter of fact, they tell me it's a symptom. What's the problem? I'm discussing the problem. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of my trouble. That's the problem. And then the book goes on to say, above everything, what does that mean? <laughs> it says, above everything, I must be rid of this selfishness or it kills me. Why don't we bring that up as a topic in meetings? I don't know what you, how you all feel, but I think the words, it kills me, are fairly significant. I think we should probably talk about that a little bit more. What is it? Selfishness. It will kill you. It's why you drink. Do you all understand the connection between your selfishness and drinking? Anybody who doesn't? You wouldn't answer anyhow. Here's the connection. If I'm consumed with myself, the world's got to present itself in a certain way for me to be okay. What will happen is it won't, that won't happen that day. She won't act the way I want, the job, whatever. And then what happens is then I begin to get diseased. I begin to get resentful. And now I begin to get blocked. And if you pile a few of those up on top of me, and then you kick fear into it, and now I'm completely blocked. At some point, I have a voice that would say, you know, you never have during corona. They got a lot of that shit down here. Besides, Mark, I'm here for you, buddy. I know it's been a long time, but I'm still here. I made all this go away. And if I'm not in fit spiritual condition, I'm going to believe that, and I'm going to take a drink. And then I'm going to activate a phenomenon called craving. And once I take a drink, I don't know where it's going to take me. That's the connection between your selfishness and dying an alcoholic death. That is what we're in the rooms for, to die the death of self. By the way, another topic. Never talked about in the rooms. Fascinating topic. Right before I make my third step decision at the bottom of page 62, it says, with God's help, you and I can be entirely rid of self. Why aren't we talking about that? Do you think they meant entirely rid of self? <laughs> no, just a horseshit line just thrown in there. Yeah, they meant entirely rid of self. I've known some men and women sitting in the rooms who are entirely rid of self. Some of you probably know some. Okay. Amazing people. Entirely rid of self. All they do is love, 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 love. Don P., Spoke the night before he died. 
last 10, 15 years of his life, you'd look into his eyes it's like looking into an ocean. See? He was entirely rid of self. It happens. See? Oh, just don't drink and go to meetings. No, no. Oh, my God, is there more? See? Beyond our wildest dreams. Beyond our wildest dreams. The depth and weight of what is available to us in the pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. No end to it. It went bored with AA. <laughs> really? His fa that, whenever I hear that, I think their favorite slogan must be, meeting makers make it. <laughs> Let me help you with that. Meetings do not bring about a change in my interior condition. I may have a little epiphany. I will certainly feel better because I'm spending a little time with my tribe. But when I walk out that door, I still got to meet myself, don't I? That's what the steps do. That's what the disciplines of 1011 do. They let the insides and the outsides match. Then you start taking that into the meetings, see? So, I had to have God's help. Bottom of page 62 is where you make your third step decision. It's about this relationship with this power. It's a very paradoxical thing. I'll give you another exercise. I've given you some great exercises, haven't I? Here's another one. Make a list of the areas currently in which you're playing God. Because in order to get God's help, what do we have to do? I had to quit playing God, didn't I? Everyone in here, we all got them. You got some areas, you're playing God. And the book goes on to tell me why you and I got to quit playing God. Because it, me, playing God doesn't work. Because <laughs> I'm not God. And I don't know what you came down here to do or how you came down here to do it. I'm here to dance my dance, sing my song, and that's what I better get my focus on. Let you do yours. Maybe you like jazz. I happen to like rock and roll and blues. I need to stay focused on that, right? Then it talks about that relationship. God's going to be my director, and you take a dictionary and you look up those words so you're clear on them. Going to be the director, and I'm going to be the actor. Going to be the principal, and I'm going to be the agent. How come we don't talk about that? What's it like to be an agent for God? You ever look up that word? You know what that word is? And you look that word up? It means someone who has been empowered to act for someone else. Oh, heaven forbid, we don't want to act like that. There wouldn't be any humility in that. Really? Why do you think the book uses it? God is my principal. I am God's agent. What heresy he's committing. No, I'm not. More of us need to stand on that. You do this work, you're an agent of God in every area of your life. Relationships and in the meetings, how you pay tax, everything, you are an agent of God. Of and for God, that power comes through you. Stand on that, claim that. That false humility, oh, I'll always be recovering. No, you won't. See, I'm a recovered alcoholic. Oh, no, heresy. Started on the title page. Take a Concordia, look up. How many times the big book used the word recovery? only once or twice use the word recovered I have recovered from a whole the state of mind and body now if I lie to you it's not because of whiskey it's because I'm a liar <laughs> See, by the way I, I'm glad we're talking about this I I sit in meetings and everyone likes to blame alcoholism for just being an asshole <laughs> see outside of a craving of the body an obsession of the mind got it that makes me an alky. Otherwise, I'm just a human being, like all other human beings, right? If I'm a jerk, it's not because I'm an alky, because I'm a jerk. We want to contribute all, well, I, I can't have a meaningful life because I'm an alky. Read the book. What is the, that isn't what the book says. It says you're supposed to be an intelligent agent, spirit of God's ever advancing creation, right? See, all that kind of stuff. So you get to make that decision about that relationship. And then you get those incredible third step promises. And then that leads us into saying the words. The words is not the decision. But think about these words and then I'm going to close. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me. And you, 
do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow night. Do a little mic check here. Is that, uh, does that sound all right for you? How about everyone else? Can you hear me all right? Never had any problems with modulation, I guess. Uh, my name's Mark Houston. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, and a power that uh, I didn't believe in, didn't have much time for, separated me from alcohol and cocaine the morning of October the 19th of 1982. And if I believe my big book, and I do, that power along with a daily course of action, working with the strict spiritual disciplines of the 10th and 11th and 12th step, have kept me from drinking. I always got to stay clear on what I'm supposed to do what, versus what God's supposed to do. Because I did the great God cop out. God keeps me sober. Well, there's this idea there's nothing but God, so of course that's a part of it. But if you really read the 10th and 11th step, it says that you and I are sitting here sober because we're in fit spiritual condition, correct? And then there's about five or six pages of what we're supposed to do of very intense, very specific stuff. Prayers to say. You're supposed to set aside some time in the morning, meditate. You're supposed to consider your plans for the day. You're supposed to ask for freedom from self, all kinds of things. And then there's a lot of tools that you're supposed to work with all through the day as you rub up against yourself. I'll talk more about this, but the 10th step is what I do once my hand is on the door and I'm coming out and interact with you. You do the 11th step in your home in the morning and in your home in the evening. But the 10th step you use when the game is on. And by the way, when you find yourself in the middle of a highway, and there's an 18-wheeler bearing down on you, that is not a good time to try and figure out how you got there. The 10th step is about move. Get the force away from yourself. Things like watch, ask, pause, turn. Turn out of yourself into, cease fighting. Practices. 10th step is an abyss, two pages. Five, six paragraphs long. We never talk about the last two or three paragraphs of the 10th step. There are a set of practices when I go out my door that I get to work with all day long. And I'll talk more about that. First nine steps allowed me to open a door into what the big book says is I've entered the world of the spirit. What does that mean? What a great question. Well, what does that mean? Tenth step, I've entered the world of the spirit. My experience is it means I've entered the world of the spirit. <laughs> See, the big, big book does stuff like this. Is, uh, it's a real tricky book. Like you'll sit in meetings and somebody will say, I don't know how it works. I do. There's a whole chapter. How it works. <laughs> well, I don't know how to sponsor someone. Well, there's a whole chapter called Into Action, Working with Others. Right? And we go, well, I, I don't know how it works. I do. Big Book gave me a set of precise, specific, clear-cut instructions on how to recover from a hopeless condition of body and mind. And it's very clear about how that process develops. So I want to uh, read a couple quotes uh, from uh, one of my meditation books. This is called uh, 365 Tao, a book of uh, daily meditations. And... Uh, First one is called practice. It says a spiritual success is gained by daily cultivation. If you practice for the day, you have won. If you are lazy for the day, then you have lost. Self cultivation is the heart of spiritual attainment. Gaining insight and ability is not a matter of grand statements, dramatic initiations, or sporadic moments of enlightenment. Those things are only highlights in a life of consistent activity. Whatever system of spirituality you practice, do it every day. If it's prayer, then pray every day. If it's meditation, then meditate every day. 
If it's exercise, then exercise every day. Only then will you be able to say that you are truly practicing spirituality. This methodical approach is reassuring in several ways. First, it provides you with a process and a means to maintain progress even if that particular day is not inspiring or significant. Just to practice is already good. Second, it gives you a certain faith. If you practice every day, it is inevitable that you will gain from it. Thirdly, constant practice gives you a certain satisfaction. How can you say to yourself you have truly entered a spiritual path unless you can look back on years of daily practice and take comfort in the momentum that it has given you? And of course, uh, our big book, when it talks to me about the 10th and 11th step, reinforces that idea. And uh, I told some of you last night that uh, I planned on doing uh, what it asked me to do in the chapter working with others. Uh, I was hoping to disturb some of you about the question of alcoholism. And I ask you to look at some things. I ask you to what you were doing with the disciplines of the 10th and 11th step. This idea of the things I need to do to stay in fit spiritual condition. I challenge you with the idea that my body can't live off the food I ate two weeks ago, and if you're trying to stay sober off an old experience, that won't work. You may find yourself in a very unexpected place called a bar or at some doctor's office getting Vicodin. Why? Because you're not in fit spiritual condition. Why? Because you're not doing the very thing that got you to where you're at. So I challenge some of you, take a look. Do you have a daily prayer and meditation life? Then, I, then I, I posed another question to you because the actions I take or don't take are always based on what? My belief systems. So if you're not working with the disciplines of 10 11, if you've gotten away from doing evening review, if you don't have a prayer and meditation life, both, what's the belief system behind that? Pardon me? Well, yeah, playing God. I don't need to do that to stay sober. Really? First step. One third of the big books devoted to looking at your first step experience. And there's three words. Again, these are words we don't talk about in our meetings that are very, very important around this idea of the mental obsession. First 33 pages, doctor's opinion, up to page 23, are designed to look at one thing. When I take a drink, do I lose power choice and control over how much? That's not a rocket scientist question. You just have to go into your experience. If your drug of no choice is something in other alcohol, such as cocaine or pills or whatever, you're going to ask yourself the same question. If I snort that line of cocaine, do I have power choice control over how much? And you only can answer that experientially. And if the answer is no, then you're powerless once it's in your body, correct? Not hard to work with. Pages 23 to 43 talk about what we talk about in the rooms about this idea of I have a mental obsession. Here's another way to look at that is I will commit the most insane act of my life stone cold sober. What do I mean by that? See, I could trick you. I could, may, I could ask you all to give me a list of the 10 most insane things you've ever done, and I promise you that everything you write in the list would be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Am I right? <laughs> well, if you're like me, if when you take a drink or if when you do drugs, you lose power choice control over how much, then once you're separated from alcohol and drugs, the most insane thing that you could ever do, and you're going to do it stone cold sober, is your mind's going to tell you to drink or do dope again, and you're going to act on that. How do you help somebody who commits the most insane act of their life stone cold sober? I work with chronic relapsers all the time, and one of my first questions is, do you think you're involved with your relapse? You know what they always tell me? Oh, yeah. Really? If I was involved with my relapse, you would have another speaker 
That means I have the power to choose whether I drink or not drink. I don't. The drink chooses me, regardless of circumstance, consequence, whatever. Right? But in those pages 23 to 43, there's these three little words they stick in there. At certain times, Mark will have no effective middle defense against the first drink. At certain times. That doesn't mean every time, does it? How about the day that you choose, you choose to not do the disciplines of 10 or 11? What if it's that day? See, if you're not, as far as I can tell, if you believe this book, if you've had the experience I had and you believe this book, and the only reason you're staying sober is fit spiritual condition, then if you're not working with the disciplines of 10 or 11, then you have a belief system. You know what the day looks like when your mind's going to take you back to a drink. Would you agree with that? See? This program, for me, I, one of the things I finally had to get very clear on, it's about a lot more than God. <laughs> There's a lot of action in here. Lots of action. I, my experience is I've got to set the alarm clock to get up in the morning. Right? There's this whole thing of what's the most important relationship in your life, right? And people lie to me and say, God. And I go, really? How much time did you give God this morning? Ooh, about five minutes. See? Am I willing to get up early to set aside time, get a little uncomfortable? Got a new mantra I'm working with this year. I'm here to build character instead of seek comfort. Sought comfort a lot of my life. Am I willing to build character? I get up between 4 and 4.15, Monday through Friday. Why? Because my life schedule is such I need to get up then to have an hour with this power, with this God, in prayer and meditation, doing what the big book says. Because here's what I have seen over time. The men and women who were my teachers and mentors and who worked out of the big book all die sober. What I've noticed about them is they're doing this stuff right up to the day they die. And I mean all of it. They're not just drinking, going to meetings, living off an old experience. They're doing the deal. They're writing current inventory. They're working with prayer. They're working with meditation. They're doing written evening review. See? Wow. But at certain times, I'll have no effective mental defense against the first drink. If I live my life as though I know that, do I even know what it means to be in fit spiritual condition? That's another great question, isn't it? Right? First step, illness of the body and mind. No human power. Once more, the alcoholic, the drug addict, at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink. Is that your experience? It was my experience. My first step experience, the first half of the first step, turned me into a seeker of power and ended the great debate. If you're like me, if every form of human aid did not work to keep you away from a drink, and if your experience is you'll commit the most insane act of your life sober, you better find some power. I tell people I'm Norwegian and Alki, but I'm not an idiot. My experience showed me I needed a relationship with a power greater than myself, and quite frankly, I didn't care what you called it. I tell people this. You have a first-step experience. You're willing to get dip, dunk, sprayed, and neutered to find God. You understand that? Steps 2 through 12 are not about 2 through 12, ladies and gentlemen. They're about your need for power. If you need power 2 through 12, it's like kissing a baby's butt compared to what whiskey does. Look what whiskey asks of you. You break the hearts of every human being who ever means anything to you. If you're a parent, you're a lousy one. When you take the drink, or if you're dying of untreated alcoholism, you're a miserable employee. The list goes on and on and on and on. And then you come in the rooms, and we say, well, do all we have, you're going to have to do a few things. Like, go through the book, work the steps. You're going to have to write inventory, three of them. That's really the first time the book does something to move you into a form of action other than look at some considerations, right? But you're going to read these inventories, and you're going to make a list of defects. 
You're going to take those to God, then you've got to make a list of all the people you've harmed. Got to pay all the money back. I was going over this one time with a guy. He looks at me, he goes, God, Mark, I just want to not drink, right? And then you've got to work with the disciplines of 10, 11, and then you've got to work with others. Now, think of what booze does to you. It does to you the same thing to me. And we hear what we've got to do when we come in the rooms and go, well, it sounds like a bit much. Really? See, how do you help somebody like that? See, a big book says, die an alcoholic death or live on a spiritual basis. And the guy looks at you and he goes, could you tell me what die an alcoholic death looks like? Right? I tell this to the guys at my recovery center all the time. Alcoholics are the only people in the world that will come to you asking for help, and you'll give them some idea what they got to do, and they'll kick you in the nuts in appreciation because they don't like what you said. Then we wonder why we're so hard to help, right? First step. That's why I go back and revisit my first step every year. My first step is what keeps me in the rooms. My first step is what keeps me writing inventory. My first step is what keeps me working with the disciplines of 10 and 11. My first step is what keeps me sponsoring men, these whiners and moaners. You know, you know, I knew. I always, I always got one or two new, needy, 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 clingy. You know. Who's going to do that unless you, unless you need to do that to live? To do, to live, to live. See? I go around the country a lot, a lot of groups, they sell chips, right? You guys have chips? You start looking around, the number of chips picked up from 10 years on up. You start looking at 20, and you start looking at 30, and it's non-existent. Where do you think these people go? You think they just go to church? I don't think so. My truth is very few people ever get sober and die sober. You lose that first step connection, your connection with what is wrong with you, right? And over time, it's a subtle thing. You start just going to a little less meetings. You used to sponsor a bunch of guys. Now you're sponsored one. It's very subtle. And then you're not calling your sponsors much. Then you wake up one day and you're out. Now you're up against yourself and you can't get back in again. I tell the guys I work with, this AA is not for sprinters. It's for marathon runners. I know all kinds of sprinters. You know, they six months on fire, boom. I'll say, yeah, well, just keep coming back, right? It's for marathon runners, one day at a time. But no quick fixes. See, am I willing to do that? Am I willing to do that process? I want to uh, read one more reading, and then I'm going to uh, move into the fourth step. Uh, I don't know if there are any of you in here struggling on the on the God issue? Any of you struggling with the God issue? Raise your hands. One person, two people. The rest of you are liars. <laughs> How do you not struggle in the God? We're talking about God. You know, give me a break. We all got God issues. It's called donkey. One of my favorite, uh, favorite readings. It says, dismount your donkey at the summit. Some places in this world are very hard to climb, and people will use animals. Each person can only ride one, and each animal might have a different name. The riders go up the trail in different orders, and they will discuss their varying opinions about their experiences. They may even have conflicting opinions. One traveler may think the trip thrilling, another may find it terrifying, and a third may find it boring. At the summit, all the travelers stand in the same place. Each of them has the same chance to view the same vista. The donkeys are put to rest and they graze. They are not needed anymore. We all travel the path to God. The donkeys are the various doctrines that each of us embraces. What does it matter which doctrine we embrace 
as long as it leads us to the summit. Your donkey might be a Zen donkey. Mine might be a Dao monk donkey. There's the AA donkey, the CA donkey, the Back to Basics donkey, the Big Book Thumper donkey. There's Christian, Islamic, Jewish, and even agnostic donkeys. All donkeys lead to the same place. Why poke fun at others over the name of their donkey? Aren't you riding one yourself? <laughs> we should put aside both the donkeys and our interim experiences once we arise at the summit. Whether we climb in suffering or joy is immaterial, we are there. All religions have different names for the ways of getting to the holy summit. Once we reach the summit, we no longer need names, and we experience all things directly. Boy, that says a lot, doesn't it? So I'm going to talk about the AA donkey. It was the AA donkey that got me to the summit. Now, once you get to the summit, it doesn't matter how people, what donkey gets them up there. And really, even within the rooms of AA. I've always uh, loved that visualization, though, particularly when I watch people when they start debating this God issue, right? And I've just often thought about that of you got a Christian donkey and you got a Buddhist donkey and a Zen donkey and an agnostic donkey and an AA. And we're going up and there's this incredible view and all we're doing is arguing about, well, the spots in my donkey are much nicer than the spots on yours. No, they're not, right? We missed the whole view. I only have one question for anybody about your donkey. Is it getting you to the summit? If not, you might want to trade the son of a bitch in. <laughs> Find one that gets you there. Get a donkey that gets you to the summit you can dismount. And then the view is the same for everybody. I found my donkey right here, right in the pages of this book. Particularly 30 pages of action that I had to take, starting with the four steps, up to the ninth step, and then a set of disciplines on a daily basis. And it took me to the summit. And I had a revolutionary spiritual experience. And I am a recovered alcoholic and cocaine addict. I am not recovering. I have recovered from a hopeless state of mind and body, exactly as my big book promised to me I would, starting on the title page. The story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered. I claim that. Get a Concordia. See how many times the big book used the word recovery that false humility, I'll always be recovering, that is inconsistent with the book. You don't have to believe me. Read your book. Right? By the way, the only disclaimer I ever give, if I say anything that you cannot reconcile with the big book, I'm wrong. But do not let anybody read your big book for you. It's full of promises starting on the, on the, on the, on the very opening page of that book all the way through to the end. It says, we have recovered and been given the power to help others. I'm not making that up. Right? We talked about some of the other incredible promises. There's promises in every step. There's third step promises, the fifth step promises. There's some of the most powerful ones in the whole book. The ninth step promise. See, I don't know about you, but, it, but you know, if you're new, there's a couple people that are new sitting in here tonight. Is there, is there any promise I can hook on to prior to the ninth step? Yeah, all kinds of them. All kinds, starting on the title page. You can recover from a hopeless state of mind and body in the forward, the first edition. All kinds of promises. What a wonderful thing. Ten-step promises. We don't talk about those. You all know what those are, don't you? Things like we've ceased fighting, anything or any bud. Wow. Things like we've been placed in a position of neutrality. We are safe and protected. Wow. Things like you have a new sixth sense. Those are all 10-step promises. We don't talk about those. You want to have fun sometime? I don't know about you, but when alcohol worked, all the ninth-step promises behind alcohol worked too. Take the ninth-step promises when alcohol worked and read them. Now try and read the 10-step promises when alcohol was working. You can't do it. It's very interesting. 10-step, though, I enter the world of the spirit. I, in particular, tonight want to move into, we went up through the third step last night, and uh, I want to talk about the fourth step. Uh, I'm big on inventory, writing inventory, pen and paper. A lot more happens between pen and paper than mind and mouth. 
I'll say that again. A lot more happens between pen and paper than mind and mouth. I watch particularly people get time. Craig, we went through this recently. Uh, he was in a situation and he called me. And there was the ex-husband was making the call. My pal Craig was non-existent. The reason I knew that wasn't even high. It's just, I got to talk. Dude, hold phone out to here. He didn't draw a breath for like five minutes. So it gets done, and I said, Will, I hope you're sitting alongside the freeway instead of driving. <laughs> no, I'm driving. When you get back to Austin, I want you to take a pen to paper, and I want you to write some inventory, and I'm not going to talk about this again until you do. He called me two more times trying to get me to talk about it. Because that's an easier, soft way. Somehow I'll talk about it. I'll make it go away. It doesn't go away. It just simmers. Then something else happens. Boom, comes up again. Four-step is not about recreating yourself in your own image. Four-step is about facing and be rid of that which has you blocked from power. The four-step is where you get entirely rid of self. That's why it's such a powerful tool. Take pen to paper. So we talked last night uh, about the third step, and I want to reiterate where the book really starts telling me what's wrong with me. And I've always thought they were very cruel when they introduced this to me because it really starts to take place on page 62 of the book, right? And then you have the 10 pages in the doctor's opinion. Now, that's 72 pages of information before they fart, finally start telling you, you and I what's wrong with us, and the word alcohol or drugs is not in there. Now, that's cruel. That's not right. Why couldn't they have done that in the beginning? See, I thought when I came in the rooms and said Alcoholics Anonymous, this was about me not drinking alcohol because I thought my problem was alcohol. 72 pages in the book, they say, no, selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of your troubles. See, I thought it was vodka, Jack Daniels. Cocaine, right? And then it describes how you and I live our life when we're selfish and self-centered. We go through life being driven. If you have not looked that word, look the word driven up. And you will find the word driven implies you have no choice. Here's how it looks for me when I'm into self-will. Limbo pulls up in front of my house. I go out and get in. The driver turns around. He says, hi, Mark. My name's Fear, and I'm going to drive your ass today. And he does all day long. And the next day, it's self-delusion. The next day, it's self-seeking. The next day, it's self-pity. But I'm being driven. Why? Because I'm into self-will. I'm into me. Choice. Choice has nothing to do with it when you're being driven. By the way, there's nothing worse than sitting in the rooms of AA sober for a while, thinking you're choosing the course of action that you take on a daily basis. I'll tell you what woke me up to the fact that maybe I wasn't choosing, maybe I was being driven, is I looked at courses of action I begin to take in sobriety that were not in my highest good. And it occurred to me, I'm too intelligent to choose that course of action. That maybe I better start looking at the idea I was being driven with no choice. Right? So that's something for you to think about. So driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. Now I want you to think about inventory as I cover this with you. How, wait, let me ask this question. Um, how many of you have written inventory, say, in the last four months? Okay. So, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, I step on the toes of my fellows. Column one of your inventory, resentment inventory, they retaliate. Column two, why you're angry. Sometimes they hurt me, third column, how do you affect you? 
see me without provocation. I didn't do anything. But I, it says we invariably find, invariably means every time. We invariably find that sometime in the past, we have made decisions based on self, third column, which later placed me in a position to be hurt. If that is true, every single time I've ever written, written inventory, I should be able to go back and see that at some point in time, I made decisions based on self, which placed me in a position to be hurt. Now, sometimes that means going back 10 to 15 to 20 years. But my experience is this is true. And then the book goes on and talks about some of my troubles are of my own making, your fourth column. Think about this. It's Groundhog Day stuff. If you're in self-will, if you're going to go through life being driven, why, what? hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity. You get up in the morning, the voices are talking. Let's go. Got to go to work. Got to sell. Got to do, do, boom, boom, whatever. Got to arrange all these people to fit you. you know? Gotta be. So you begin this course of action. Your course of action conflicts with theirs, and some of them get upset with you. And they do what the book says. They retaliate. And then your feelings are hurt. Then you bring that crap into my meeting instead of write inventory on it. No. <laughs> but that's what happens. And that happens long enough, and then you, you and I start to get diseased. And then one day the voice says, at certain time, Mark, I know what would treat that. It's a drink or a drug or a line. And if I'm not in fit spiritual condition, I'll act on that, commit the most insane act of my life, sober. So all my troubles are of my own making. And it goes on to say, my troubles arise out of me, and I am an extreme example of self or one riot, though I do not think so. Now the book gets a little more serious about our dilemma. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of the selfishness. We must or it kills us. See, if you're not working, this is my experience. If you're not working with the daily disciplines of 10 or 11, your selfishness is growing and growing and growing. You cannot defeat your ego. See, I don't care how long you're sober. You cannot defeat your ego. It will take the best of us. That's the whole purpose of the disciplines of 10 or 11, is to wake yourself up to your selfishness. All that happens when you get sober over a longer period of time, your stage characters change. That's all that happens. They get nicer and kinder, more spiritual and more evolved. But there's, it's still all tricks of the ego. That's all. They just change. They're craftier. Get kinder, right? You can't, you can't defeat the ego, you see. So it's interesting. We must get rid of the selfish. We must or it kills us. And, of course, God's name is in the next sentence, and we, our name is not. My self-will cannot eliminate my self-will, which is why all the self-help books in the world don't help people like us. I'm okay, you're okay, and the cat's okay. Doesn't work. What works for me is I'm an ass, you're an ass, and I'm okay with that. See, that kind of stuff doesn't work for me. I've tried it. I have. I really have. I've tried to self-will myself into being a nice person. It doesn't work. It goes against my very nature, right? Book, the big, big book earlier talked about that. It talks about even when Mark's motives are kind. He is selfish and self-centered. Watch out! Right? That's what I told you the other night. Now it's nice elky. Scare me. Because I know better. Thank God we were given the AA donkey. It allows us to function in the world. See, they, they sent us, they give us our own tribe. We got to meet, see, only with each other. And other people don't understand us. Now it goes on, it says there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without God's aid. I told you this last night. That sentence tells me that if I'm willing to continue to do some things in this book, I can be entirely rid of self. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but on any given day, I get real tired of Mark. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? See, Can you imagine that? Entirely rid of self. See, Craig came up to me one day, and he says, I want to become enlightened. And I said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. And he said, why? I said, because the part of you that wants to get enlightened, if it happens, you will not be around to recognize it. 
He said, well, I don't want to be enlightened if I can't recognize it. <laughs> right? I can be entirely rid of self with God's aid. How does that happen? The steps. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Make amends. Discipline 10, 11. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Entirely rid of self. Amazing. Amazing process. And then it goes on and talks about you and I have this moral and philosophical convictions galore. You know, I'm going to be a neat guy, pay taxes, honor my relationships, be a man of integrity. I'm going to work out six days a week, get buff, you know, quit all bad vices, eat nothing but nutritious food. How's that working for you? <laughs> Not good. You know, I'm going to buy 14 books as I'm trying to do all this and then I turn around and give him the next alky who's going to try that because they don't work for me. And, you know. So I see that this is me. I can't live up to it even though I would like to. Neither can I reduce my self-centeredness by wishing or trying on my own power. See, here's where I'm up against when I, when I look at this second and third step and move into the fourth. My own power versus do I need God's power. That's, what I'm, that's where the rub is. I had to have God's help. Do I? Yeah, yeah. So this is, then the book said, this is how you're going to get God's help. Earlier on, the book told you and I where we're going to find God, deep down within. Matter of fact, it says in the final analysis, that's the only place that we'll find God. I tell the men that I, that I work with that this is a neat deal. The very power I need dwells within me, but I'm blocked from it. Call it a jewel, call it whatever. But it exists within, and I'm blocked. Four through nine will remove that. And the very power that I need to change and transform my life, I don't have to go anywhere. I can find it in Cabo, Austin, Texas, anywhere. What a wonderful, incredible thing if I'm willing to just take a course of action. See, I don't know about the rest of you, but that was like a Cheech and Chong moment. I had this idea somehow I had to go somewhere to experience God, and that God was out there. The idea that I'm going to have this experience internally was a whole new concept for me, right? So here's how I'm going to get God's help. I got to quit playing God. I gave some of you an assignment if you wanted to try it last night. Make a list of your areas currently in your life in which you like to play God. Any of you do that, by the way? Seriously, that, that's a great exercise. Did you do that? Good. In your head? It's kind of funny, isn't it? Seriously. See, the reason I, I wanted to throw this out to you, I don't think you're much different than me. I think most of you have a whole bunch of areas you want to play God in. You've just been sober long enough to pretend you ain't got that going on. See? That makes sense? You understand what I just said to you? Remember, you get craftier. See, the toolkit of self-will, the longer you're sober, it's just craftier, that's all. You'll use kindness. Let me get that for you. <laughs> all right. Still a toolkit of self-will. But it talks about the reason you and I are going to quit playing God is because yet me playing God doesn't work. Do I believe that? Do I believe that? Yeah. Yes. Every time I go back and look at this, where am I playing God? And do I believe that me playing God doesn't work? Yes. Why is that important? Because somewhere in here, there must be a collapse of the self. The, a collapse to the point to understand that you're part of a greater whole and you don't have a clue about any of it. How long people are supposed to be here, how long they're supposed to live, you name it. Where you live, all of it. It's that kind of a collapse. You understand? That kind of a collapse, where you become a part of a plan. See? You're going to quit playing God. What does that mean for me? It means where I live, who's in my life, who's not, where, where, what I do for a living, all of it. All of it is in the hands of someone else. The only thing I worry about is what's within my control. What do I mean by that this morning? What time I got up, setting the alarm clock, doing the disciplines of the 10th and 11th step this morning. If I wanted to work out today, I could do that. If I wanted to eat right today, I could do that. All kinds. That's what's within my domain. The rest of it is not. It just isn't. 
I'm along for the ride. See, I kind of like living in Denver, Colorado. If I didn't see it, I'd never got to Texas. I've been in Texas since 1991. My resistance, the way I wound up there, was I wound up going there through a nut house. Don't resist this thing. God wants you in Texas, you're going to Texas. See, I didn't know for the longest time why the book warns you and I when we make this third step decision. See, people rub up against this third step and they say this third step prayer in which you say to God, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and you do with me as thou wilt. I'm going to go back to my episode in Texas. I had three job offers to come to Texas the two years prior to going to the psych hospital. I turned them all down. Why? Because I didn't want to go to Texas. God said, look, got work for you down here, boy. Gonna get, we're going to try it this way. You're going to get a nice job offer. They're willing to move you down. All kinds of stuff. No, thank you. I like it here. Okay, we're going to try it again. Right? We try another offer. Nah, I got it. I got it. Okay, cool. You gave your life to me. It's a good thing you did. You weren't doing too well. I got work for you in Texas. Now we're going to do it my way. You're going to be really depressed to the point where you can't work. and You can't leave your apartment. And you're going to get really uncomfortable. I'm going to leave you in the desert for a while. You want to stay in Denver? You go right ahead. Have a good day. And I rode out the desert experience. And through a series of events, I wound up in Texas. Got some water back in my diet again. I said, hmm. When I got released from that place, I made an agreement. God, I'm going to try and pay a little bit more attention next time when you want me going somewhere. Matter of fact, I'm just going to travel light for a while. That's exactly what happened. I was in Houston, Texas for a while, and then Kerrville, Texas, and then Austin, Texas, then Dallas, Texas. Now I'm back in Austin. Now I will tell you this, and all the time I've been sober, I feel like I can sink roots. First time. I know what it's like to get sent out. See, we say this third step prayer, and then we forget what we said because we think they're just words. They're just little words, right? See, Some of you, I, I know some of you are going through some suffering. I want you to understand what you said to that which created everything. I offer myself to thee to build with me and you do with me as you want. And then that power does that and you whine. Doesn't work that way. See? See, somewhere in there, what I had to learn along the way was I had to have faith and courage. And I had to look at myself like a child, a little two, three-year-old child. You know, I... I have a tendency to play with sharp knives, right? Parent takes it away. What's a child do? Child gets upset. Parents taking it away for the child's own benefit, right? See, that's what I've had to look at in terms of me and this relationship with God. And that's just the way I am. I whine a lot when the knife, the shiny object, gets taken away from me. You stay sober long enough, you start to understand why that happened. So, we say the third step prayer. And then off of that prayer, now we're going to launch into inventory. And I want to talk uh, about resentment inventory. They use some great words. Personal house cleaning, though my third step decision was a vital and crucial step. It, by the way, my experience is when you go through the big book and the book uses the word it, always know what it means because it does that a lot but know what it means. Though my third step decision was vital and crucial, it will have little permanent effect. What do you think they meant there? You don't think they meant permanent effect, do you? Yeah, they meant permanent effect. A permanent effect. I've never drank since the time I did this. I have experienced a permanent effect. Why? Because I was willing to do the rest of the work. Relapse is not complex. It is not. There's a set of precise, specific, clear-cut instructions. And the book says, if you're willing to do them, you cannot fail. The only people I've seen that could not maintain permanent sobriety were the ones who would not submit to this process. 
I don't know if there's such a thing as reincarnation. If there is, I must not have been a nice guy in the last lifetime. And the reason I say that is I normally only get to sponsor chronic relapsers. Their four favorite words are I know and yes, but. They know more about the big book than I ever thought of. And they like to point that out to me. But they can't stay sober. Finally, they come to me, and it's, it's not complex, and it's not because of stuff that happened to them as a child. It's because they've never been willing to surrender one day at a time and go through this process and gain access to power and then keep doing that. Most of them don't want to work with other people. They're too selfish. But I don't find relapse to be any big secret whatsoever. So let's go on and look at some of our instructions around the four steps. Here's what this is. I'm gonna have, this is going to be a strenuous effort to face and to be rid of the things inside me which have been blocking me from what? Power. The power I need. That's the only reason I write inventory, ladies and gentlemen. There is no other reason. I need access to power, and I'm blocked from it. Here's where the book starts to tell you and I that my liquor or my drugs is but a symptom. When you go to a doctor, what does the doctor do? He asks you a series of questions if you're not feeling well, correct? And what do you report to him? Symptoms. Does he treat the symptoms or the problem? The sim he, you know, he treats the problem. Your drinking and or your drug use is not the problem. It is a symptom. Do you get that? Earlier, the book told us what the problem was. You remember what that was? It said, above everything, we must be rid of what? That's the problem, selfishness. That's the problem. If, for whatever reason, and you'll have to complain to God about this because I don't understand it either. When I get consumed with myself, I like to drink. I don't know why, I just do, and so do you. Or you don't drink, but you get real miserable. When you think everything's about you. The spotlight's always got to be on you. It's got to work out the way you want. Don't know why that is. I don't know why we're that way, but we are. That's why the book says at this point, Mark, your booze is but a symptom. We got to get down to causes, second column, and conditions, third column. If you haven't looked, taken a dictionary, look up the word causes and conditions. Condition refers to a state of being. Remember last night? I, I gave you uh, all something to look at, too. Identify your list of characters, your stage characters. All the different things that you think define who and what you are. Every one of those is a state of being. Look up the word condition. It refers to a state of being. Big book, when it's go, it goes from the third column to fourth column, says, in that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancy real has the power to kill. So you'll come back to this. When I really began to work a lot with inventory, I truly became a student, and I started looking these words up, and I started seeing, because I was watching these incredible things happen off of writing inventory and doing fifth steps, and I could not understand why. How can you write these three inventories, sit across from somebody, do a fifth step, and then get catapulted into the fifth step promises? Not to mention amends. How does that happen? That makes no sense whatsoever. So I started to really explore that, say, what takes place here? I knew somehow it was connected to entirely being rid of self. And that's what happens, ladies and gentlemen, four through nine. As you begin to get disconnected from all these mind-made false sense of self that you think defined you, that makes you afraid all the time. You begin to get pulled back from that. You begin to... Be rid of that which has you blocked from what? God, the power deep down within. And you begin to feel that connection, that sense of oneness. And you begin to know that all is well in spite of what's going on out here. And you begin to touch that part of you, true self, call it what you will, awakened spirit, whatever. But that's why, to me, I begin to pay so much attention to the fourth step and the fifth step. It's also why I begin to do what I call multiple fifth steps, where you take a body of work and read it to one, two, three, four, five different people. Fabulous experience. If you haven't tried it, try it. 
big book said I need to take my inventory and read it to person or persons, plural. By the way, one, one thing I'll throw out here. If you've never taken a body of inventory and read it to several people, then you have no experience with it, right? All you have is an opinion. I'm not interested in your opinion of an experience you've never had. That was one of my major defects for years. I would give you my opinion on all kinds of experiences I'd never had. Finally, I said to myself, self, that needs to go away. So in 1995, I was approached with the idea of doing multiple fifth steps. So I did. I went to California and did one. Did one in Kerrville, Texas. Went down to Louisiana. Read one to a woman long time sober. Did three fifth steps within one month. Sat with that, three of them. It was an incredible experience. Had no reservation about amends whatsoever. Saw tremendous levels of truth through the three fifth steps. I've been doing multiple fifth steps ever since. Now, when I had an opinion and no experience, I didn't do them. I'll tell you what I realized in hindsight is my ego was scared to death that it was going to get broken down. Let me see if I can explain what I mean by that for just a moment. You know, a lot of times you go in meetings, they'll have meetings on forgiveness. You ever been to a meeting on forgiveness? This is my experience. I don't have to operate with for the concept of forgiveness. Here's why. If I'll do inventory work, the part of me that would need to forgive dies, and there's nothing to forget. See, the ego to the ego self all I do is enhance the memory if I'm working on trying to forgive you. It gets worse for me. It doesn't get better. What has to happen is the part of me that would need to forgive better die. And the only way I know how to do that is steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So, let's talk about it. You're going to make a list of people, institutions, or principles with whom you're mad. Whenever I write inventory, I write down. Why? Because the instructions. They gave us make a list and they put a period. They didn't say right across. So I stop, I say a prayer, and the names flow. People, institutions, principles. When I first started writing inventory, I didn't have many principles, and the reason is on my inventory is because I didn't have many principles. And over time I began to understand what principles were. And I didn't like a lot of them. And I wrote a lot of inventory on it. I love writing the second column. That's where I'm angry. And I use bullets. And I don't pull any punches. And I try and describe behavior specifically. Right? Recently, <laughs> wrote, wrote some inventory. Second, the second column gets to be very, very important in terms of your third and your fourth column. So now I'm done, and now I have a list, people, institutions, principles. Now I have my second column. And now I like to take out a legal pad, and I write the name at the top, and I write the second column, and now I'm going to write my third column. Now, the big book presents to you and I seven areas of self that are hurt, threatened, or interfered with. Those seven areas are self-esteem. That's how I see and feel about myself behind my resentment, right? Pride, that's how others see me. No one should. Ambition, it's what I wanted. It's what I wanted you to do. Right? Security, what I need to be okay. Personal relations, same sex. Sex relations, opposite sex. Money, seven areas of self. This is what I've learned over time. Third column is where you're playing God. Do not write the third column from an aspect of low self-esteem because God does not have low self-esteem. You and I are writing the resentment because we got just a little bit too much. Otherwise, we wouldn't have it. Now, over the for periods of time, initially, when I started working with inventory, when I get to my third column, I would just write the word out, like my self-esteem was affected or my pride or my ambition. What finally happened was I could not I didn't get free doing that. So there were a bunch of guys in Denver belonged to a group called the God Squad, a guy named Big Frank, scary guy, big, 
biggest hand and heads on any guy human I ever met. <laughs> Ex sheep herder turned lawyer. He's dead now. Uh, he died with about 42 years of sobriety. Brilliant man. He was something else, I tell you. He, uh, but he, he did a thing called Theater of the Lie. And they really, really expanded on the third column, self-esteem. I'll give you an example how I do this. I recently wrote an inventory on a guy that I've done some work with. Column two, and I'll paraphrase. Doesn't walk the walk. He's a liar. Talks the talk, but doesn't do the deal. Remember I told you we all got stage characters? So guess who's writing this inventory? The sponsor. He's making the sponsor look bad here. Right? See? I also put down there that he was a poor employee. That was in there. So I had three, four, five, six things. Now, were those true? Yes. I, how am I going to make the second column into a lie? Because I have to. If I'm going to write inventory, I'm going to take, I've got to turn that second column, the, what I think is the truth of the second column, and turn it into a lie. So here's the first thing I see. In order for me to write anything in the second column, in the third column, I'm God. So under self-esteem, I'm a step worker. Judgment. I'm walking the walk. I'm a good employee. Judgment. You follow me? Everything I wrote in the second. Under self-esteem, I think I'm exactly the opposite, which is the only reason I wrote it there to begin with. I didn't write this inventory because I suffered from low self-esteem. I got just a little bit too much. Pride. No one should see a sponsee of mine not doing the deal. Wow. No one should not give their employer a fair day's work. Ambition. What do I want? I want him doing the deal, walking the walk, giving me a fair day's labor and growing balls. I did, right? Security, what do I need to be okay? I need people I've done the work with to act like men of integrity to be okay. Whoa, whoa. I'm up against some stuff, aren't I? Right? See, sober long time. I like this guy. Look what I'm up against here. Little, little, little inventory in the second column, right? I'm, I'm in my 26th year. Bullshit, I'm fighting for my life. This is about drinking whiskey. Right? I'm upset about what, how he, whether he's walking the walk or not. Yeah, I am. You bet I am. Right? Personal relations. Real men honor other men who've helped them. Right? Wow. Isn't that interesting? Money. Pocketbook. I am my money. Right? Don't mess with my money. Now, that's my third column. You see how I play God? In that third column, remember last night I gave you a little visual? You all went home, sit in your little amphitheater, you're up in your little throne chair, looking at all these people in your life you're trying to arrange. If your arrangements would only stay put, if only they'd do as they wished, you'd be happy and satisfied, right? So you start to look at this. He's sitting out there. Then I move over to the fourth column. What mistakes did I make? Well, let's see. This is the third time I've hired this guy. The first two, I had to fire him too, right? Why did I do that? Because I'm too lazy to interview anyone else. I got shit to do. See, I love writing inventory. There's all kinds of stuff in there. Amazing. And what I did is, what I wrote in the third and fourth column, because everything, by the way, that I wrote in the second column that I resented was the truth. But my third and fourth column turned that into a lie, because at the end of the day, my troubles are my own making. You see how free I got? Wow, what a deal. And then I write fear inventory. I've written fear inventory a lot of different ways. My current one, I just did a two-column fear inventory, but I work with my current fears. Remember I threw out to you last night, try something. All of you, if you take the last week or two, you've had reoccurring fears go through your mind. This is not where you got 50 or 100 of them. It's the ones that keep going through your mind. The, the stuff that you're rubbing up against now. So column one, what's the fear, right? Column two, why do you have the fear? For example, who's got a fear? Give me a fear you're working with. Anybody. What is it? 
Okay, so what's the fear? Okay, so you're afraid because she's going to have a baby, and the reason you have it is you've never been a father before. Okay, good. Give me another one. Pardon me? Failure? Is that what someone said? Why do you have that fear? Well, it won't feel good if you fail. It affects your image, right? Now, by the way, if you're going to write on failure, write on the other, success. One of the things I, I like to do with people if they've had a little time is I have them write on what I call the Big 12. Failure, success. Acceptance, rejection. Sobriety, drinking. God, no God, God agnosticism. Living and dying. Let's see, what's the last one? Oh, um, well, I, I mentioned acceptance, rejection. I came up with those because I've listened to so many inventory and written so many. Those 12 cover the bulk of most fears. Oh, the, that was the other one. Everyone has this big fear of abandonment, right? Well, let me, I'm going I'm to see if I can help you with this, with this fear. The reason you have it is because it will happen. <laughs> it's supposed to happen. You and I live in a world of impermanence. Started the minute I was born. I've been abandoned ever since by everything that meant anything to me. That's why I turned to God. Wow. And I live in that. And I take that into an ever-changing life situation in which everything that I think is going to give me some sense of satisfaction will abandon me and will leave me. But being connected to God, that oneness, that never leaves me. And all is well. And it's all on loan. And I, it's impossible for me to be abandoned anymore. See? It wasn't mine to begin with. Mine, mine, my car, my AA group. Anytime you use that word, you're going to be writing some inventory. My wife. Watch, watch, pay attention to your language, ladies and gentlemen. My job, my home, mine, mine. That's where all your inventory comes from. It's where all your fear. You think that shit, you own it. You think it defines you. You have attachments to it. But you walk around afraid all the time. Mine. <laughs> See, it's a paradox. When my life is simple, living in a one-bedroom apartment, no big deal, right? Now I've got... Three million dollars worth of property that the, the company I started sits on. Do you think there's more fear associated with that by chance? <laughs> See, that's not right. See, I was taught you get more, get right. Actually, there's not more fear associated with that. There would have been at one time, but there's not. We're the world like a loose garment. Move in, move out. It's all on loan. See? No attachments. Present moment, God, rid of self, love things as they are, stay present, right? It's all on loan, mine, it doesn't exist, See? nothing belongs to us, it's all on loan. You don't breathe on your own power, you do nothing on your own power. There's only the illusion of separateness. I love the, the people who talk about, well, I have control issues. No, you don't. You have illusion issues. There's no such thing as control. I mean, go, go down to breath. Did any of you control your breathing today? No. The most non-recognized essential element in your life, and most of you went through the whole day and didn't think of it one time, your breath. Am I right? Am I right? Sure. You guys are afraid to answer anything now, aren't you? <laughs> Not raising my hand. I don't care what he says. <laughs> Waking up. It's a call to wake up. Steps are a call to wake up. Have fun with yourself. Have fun with your life. God, quit taking yourself so serious. Ooh. Have fun. Tell the men I work with. I, you know, Craig, we, we laugh all the time. Me and my pal, we laugh all the time at ourselves. Get interested in your true self. You are amazing. See, I am funny. This my it's just insane, you know. Today we're 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 laughing because I 
And they said, what'd you do? And I said, well, actually, I, th- I napped all day. I haven't done that like I was junior in high school or something. And I did. Got up at 6.30 and did my disciplines, had something to eat, went back to bed. Next thing I knew, it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon, right? Well, in one of those moments, when I went out, <clears throat> drink of water or whatever, well, Craig came in, he's talking to me. Well, unbeknownst to him, because he falls asleep sometime, I'd gone back in, closed the door. He's still talking. Five, 10, 15 minutes. Doesn't realize I'm completely gone, right? <laughs> See? Then by the time he wakes up to it, because I know how he is, I guarantee you he looked to see if the neighbor by chance saw him talking to himself. <laughs> see, how do you not laugh at that kind of stuff, right? You know? We do, but we have fun, see? And watching Brad get all twisted up, right? We're... <laughs> he and I were talking today, you know, you get your sense of self outside yourself, right? So... So he wants to make sure all these people that came in from out of town, which is vast numbers, have an amazing time so he can be liked and loved. Then he resents you all for doing all the shit he's got to do for you. (laughs) How do you not laugh at that? You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I tell you, that's why we have our own tribe. Just, you know, we don't mix well with those others. see? (laughs) See, we understand that, you know. (laughs) <laughs> oh, but all this stuff comes. Write the inventories. Write the fear inventories. Sex inventory. It's about relationships, not just about the sexual energy. You write those three inventories, and you turn around and you do a fifth step. I want to uh, close tonight reading the fifth step promises, and because uh, to me there's some of the most powerful in the whole book, and they're on page uh, 75, and you get done reading these three inventories to someone, it says, we pocket our pride, we go to it, we illuminate every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we've taken this step, withholding nothing, and then here are my fifth step promises, it says we are delighted, we can look the world in the eye, we can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we're on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Don't get any better than that. God bless you. See you Monday. Mark Houston. (laughs) Evening, everybody. I'm Mark Houston. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, I wasn't going to get up unless he made a mince to y'all and cleaned his shit up. Isn't that great? I love it. I was separated from uh, alcohol and cocaine the morning of October 19th of 1982, and I am very, very grateful for that. A couple things, then I want to read a meditation from one of my favorite meditation books called 365 Tao. Uh, uh, I have really had an amazingly relaxing, uh, energizing time since I've been down here, and uh, uh, over the years, when I, I feel led to come and be a part of something like this, that is not always my experience. So uh, it has been, um, it's been great, just great. I, I want to thank each and, and every one of you who, who uh, you know, contributed to that. I, I do know there's two elements to that. You know, the longer I get sober and the less I operate in fear, the more I demonstrate love, then strange enough, there's never anything between me and you anymore. There's no such thing as separation and fear. So I know that I have a little bit to do with that. And then, uh, you know, the rest of it is what you all have to do with that. So uh, Craig and I were talking, and I think I'm going to pretty well make this a yearly trip down here. So that's a good thing. And I'll do my best to bring more and more of my pals down here with me. 
Okay. Um, this is called uh, compassion. It says, once you have seen the face of God, you will see that same face on everyone that you meet. The true God has no face. The true Tao has no name. But we cannot identify with that until we're of a very high level of insight. Until then, the gods with faces and the Tao with names are still more worthy of veneration and study than the illusions of the world. With long and sincere training, it is possible to see the face of God. Holiness is not about scientific objectivity. It is about a deep and clear recognition of the true nature of life. Your attitude toward your God will be different than anyone else's God. Divinity is a reflection of your own understanding. If your experience differs from others, that does not invalidate your sense of godliness. You will have no doubts after you have seen. Knowing God is the source of compassion in our lives. We realize that our separation from others is strictly artificial. We are neither separate from other people nor from God. It is only our own egotism that leads us to define ourselves as individuals. In fact, a direct experience of God is a direct experience of the utter universality of life. If we allow it to change our way of thinking, we will understand our essential oneness with all things. How does God look? Once you see God, you will see that same face on every person you meet. Came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and first and foremost uh, became a part of the fellowship. And then I met a man and, and the man took me into the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and said, there's a set of precise, specific, clear-cut instructions. And if you're willing to work these with me, you'll have a revolutionary experience and you will see the face of God. And I thought he was smoking reefer when he said that to me. But you know what? That has exactly been my truth. Um, that big book is, is amazing. Over the years, uh, uh, some, of it, some of you might relate to this. Uh, I was really driven down what I call the path of knowledge for periods of time, trying to understand what had happened to me, understand God, if you will. And by the way, I didn't choose that either. Uh, I uh, got sent down to Kerrville, Texas, 1991, small little community down there, and uh, I started a group down there called the Carry the Message Group and started sponsoring a bunch of men, and I had to, to look for my teachers sometimes in tapes and books and all kinds of stuff, and so along the way, I, I wound up uh, studying for three years with a Native American uh, medicine man, doing the sweats and, 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 you know, walking the red road for a while. I... That was an interesting experience because Texas has got a lot of Baptists in it, and I had one next door to me, and in the back of my yard, I took a bunch of stones, and I made a circle in the red road, and, the, and I, I would sit out there and meditate, and I found out later he thought I was a pagan worshiper. <laughs> it was an interesting experience, but I uh, uh, did a bunch of sweat lodges, and, and uh, it, was, it was a good experience. For me in so many ways, I'd lost my connection to Mother Earth and that sense of nature and that sense of oneness. And then uh, uh, as a result of not doing anything with meditation in my first 10 years, my mind drove me insane between my ninth and 10th year of sobriety. That's the truth. And uh, so I really became a student of meditation. You know, it's, of course, it's mentioned in the big book. Uh, it's very clear that well, we're supposed to do that every morning. Um, matter of fact, take a Concordia sometime, look up the word meditation, and see how often it's mentioned in terms of spiritual practices. By the way, I, I, I want to make this statement. You go to the ocean with a thimble, you get a thimble molt full of water. How much of God you want, and it's up to you and nobody else. You want to take a dump truck, you can get a dump, dump truck full of God. There's this idea, God gives us free will. You look at the line, the steps in the big book. And within the framework of free will, there's self-will and God's will. Probably, right? If you look at what the steps do in steps four through nine, 
they wind up taking my self-will and aligning it with God's will. And by the time I get to the 10th step, the 10th step's about line of the will. And then I wonder why my life has changed. You know, I don't think God's will is very complex. I, I think, uh, what, Buddhism, there's the eight noble truths, 10 commandments. I don't think it's real complex stuff, you know. Be nice, you know. <laughs> Law of cause and effect. If you steal, somebody will steal from you. You, sit, you know, it's uh, be honest. You know, we want to, oh, I wonder what God's will is. You know, it's pay your bills on time. You know, don't steal from people. Uh, you know, don't say unkind things. I mean, you know, it's not, <laughs> you don't have to go sit and levitate trying to figure that out. You just really don't. Uh, it's, it, I think it's in front of you. But so back to some of my journey again, I, I really began to, to become a, a and, and study a lot about meditation and self-realization fellowship. Some of you may know something about that. They have a lot of meditation techniques. Teacher Paramahansa Yogananda. Um, I particularly begin to look at some of the stuff in Buddhism since they've been doing the most meditation the longest, like 2,000 plus years, etc. I discovered as I traveled around, uh, particularly to Christian monasteries and those kinds of things, that they were a little light in the area of meditation, and since my mind had driven me wacko, I wanted to make sure that didn't happen again. So I gravitated and moved, moved toward that, and I began a daily meditation life in 1991, which I still have up to today. And if, if you said to me, of everything you've done since you were born or since you came into the rooms of AA, what is the single thing that you have ever done that had the greatest impact on your life, and I will tell you that it is meditation, going into the silence. Because in that experience, which my big book, by the way, says to do, 365 days a year, if anyone can show me where I get a few days off, I'd like to see it. I can't, I can't find that. I've tried to find it. But it says do this every day. And in that process, I finally realized who I really was. I realized who I was not, and I lost my identification with my mind. And my mind became like a hand. I am not my mind. And it's incessant chatter of a thousand monkeys. My mind is just like a computer that you leave running with some software. That's all it is. Most of the time, I don't pay any attention to it. You know, I'm a lot more interested in the things that begin to happen to me in a level of consciousness I experience through the process of meditation. When I first begin to meditate, I, I begin to notice things. I begin to notice I was uh, a lot less afraid. Fear, well, you know, it's not surprising the fear inventory is between the resentment inventory and the sex inventory or personal relationships. Every alka I've ever met, paralyzed with fear. The fabric of our being is interwoven with fear. We live with it. Anything I can do to reduce that, I need to do it. And, of course, you know, I read to me what that fear is about. That's that sense of separation. And as far as I can tell, the work in steps 4 through 9 in the disciplines of 10 and 11 help remove this idea from me that I'm separate from you. Meditation becomes a vehicle that I get to use. They introduced me to some stuff I'll talk about in a little bit in the 10 steps. It says I got a new sixth sense. Well, what does that mean? You know? I, I hope uh, after we've spent a little time together that I have challenged some of you to look at some of these incredible promises and some of these, this information in this book and start talking about it in meetings. Why aren't we talking about the sixth sense in the tenth step? Why aren't we talking about in the tenth step it being the line of the will? What does that mean? Why aren't we talking about being an agent of and for God? Why aren't we talking about that stuff? Where are we talking about we have recovered and been given the power to help others? Right? I think it's really powerful, powerful stuff. Juicy stuff, man. Where are we talking about we've entered the world of spirit, and from now till the day we die, there's a way we can stay in that world of the spirit and grow an understanding of effectiveness and take it into every area of our life. All of our relationships and our work, everything, every area of our life. Where are we talking about that stuff? I don't know. That's a lie. I do know. We, we talk about what we're doing. I'll say it again. We talk about what we're doing. We don't talk about what we're not doing. 
That's why. You know, uh, I, I cringe when I go to meetings. Anybody have a topic? I'm going, oh, no. You know, just where's the, you know, where do they come from? Self-pity or depending on the size of the population, it might be traffic. You know, it's just, it's just crazy, you know. But there's such, such incredible stuff to talk about. I want to um, go back. I was talking a little bit earlier to a, a young lady who talked about a lot of experience with relapse. And uh, I've worked with a lot of men and a lot of women who have chronic relapse history. And God has used me to help those people. And what I find that all in common is uh, they have never understood the first step. Most of them think that alcohol and or drugs, your drug of no choice, whatever that is that you think is your drug of choice, <laughs> um, they think that's the problem. See, if alcohol was my problem, just not drinking would be my solution. Do you get that? And the big book would be two pages long. It'd say, just don't drink. Unfortunately, alcohol is not my problem. It is a symptom. Big book waits till I get up to the fourth step to present the idea of what is wrong with me. And my problem is I, I'm brutally selfish. And I think everything is about me. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of my troubles. And for whatever reason, if that doesn't leave me, if that doesn't leave, go away from me, I become so angst and diseased operating in the world that I drink to treat that. So the whole issue has never been about alcohol. The whole issue is I think everything's about me. Right? Selfishness. And the book, book goes on to say, above everything, Mark, you better get rid of your selfishness or it, your selfishness, will kill you. That's what I, uh, unbeknownst to me, when I came into the rooms, that's what I was up against. Drinking is a byproduct of that. You know, all you got to do is look at all the examples I think the book gives you to see the truth of what the book is saying. For example, there's a whole chapter devoted to working with others, Correct. As a matter of fact, that chapter goes on to say, when all else fails, work with someone else. So let's see. Let me think. What would be the opposite of selfishness? Working with somebody else. <laughs> right? Gee, I wonder why that's in there. Well, you know. See, if I'm sitting across working with a, another alcoholic, I totally lose my connection with me. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but if you live with me all the time, you would want to lose that connection at times. That's why I sponsor a lot of people. I really need to get away from me for long periods of time. Incessant dialogue starts, right? You know, your committee, you all, by the way, are you doing a good job identifying your host of characters? You got up this morning, your little table with all the different committee members, right? You got... Mr. AA guy, Miss AA, spiritual man, spiritual woman, and whatever else it is. You got a husband probably, got a wife, right? Got a businessman, got retired businessman, you know? Got the timeshare condominium seller, he's down here. <laughs> got, a, got a boat captain's down here. I mean, you got all kinds of different stage characters down here, right? You know? You got the got the cooks and the just but it's all your little host all those voices how you doing how you going you got to go do you know had him get a cup of coffee and it's already got you out to 10 o'clock tonight right i tell i tell people there's a reason we shoot ourselves in the head instead of the foot is to stop the voices <laughs> somebody's got to chair the meeting Probably helps if it be the spiritual man or spiritual woman. But so the first step, craving the body, obsession of the mind, experientially driven, not rocket scientists. Doesn't take a lot to tell if I'm a real alcoholic or a real drug addict. I'm the guy on page 21. When I take a drink, do I lose control, power and choice over how much, yes or no? Go back into the drinking. Sober, do I have a mind that takes me back to it? Do I commit the most insane act of my life, stone cold sober? Because if you've lost power, choice, control once it's in your body and then you have a pure sobriety and go back to it again, that, ladies and gentlemen, is called insanity. See, the relapse ends when I take a drink. It doesn't start then. It ends then. It ends then because I'm going to break out in a phenomenon called craving. My last drink lasts a year and a half. I love it. I hear people sit in the rooms. They, they talk as though they know what would happen if they took a drink. 
If I knew what would happen when I took a drink, you'd have another speaker. I, would, I don't need to go to the rooms anymore. My problem is when I take a drink, I don't have a clue what would happen. I'm serious. My last drink last a year and a half. I thought I knew what was going to happen. I didn't. Drank for a year and a half. Right? See, that's me. That's my experience. I'm a real alcoholic. Do I believe that? Do I believe that no human power can separate me from alcohol and drugs and keep me separated? I'm probably like most of you. I quit drinking a whole bunch of times. Quitting was never the issue. Could I stay quit on my own power? No. That was my experience. So am I what the big book says at the bottom of page 43? Once more, Mark, at certain times, has no effective middle defense against the first drink. Mark, is that your experience? Yes. Mark's defense must, M-U-S-T, come from a power greater than himself. I became a seeker of power once I saw the truth of that sentence. I became that then, and I still am today. Now, some people call it God. I wasn't interested in God. I was interested in the power behind the name. You get what I just said. I was interested in experiencing the power behind the name, and I wasn't interested in believing in God. Most people I know walk into the rooms believing in God. Well, let me ask this question. How many of you believed in God and drank a lot? Well, it, then we come into the rooms and we get sober. Must not have anything to do with believing in God then. What does it have to do with? has to do with experiencing the power behind the name. I mentioned this to you the other night. The trap, the trap of thinking that because you believe in God, you do. It's a great trap of the ego. For you to tell me you believe in God. Really? Do you, are you living your life as though you do? Well, what do you mean? Well, you're afraid a lot. Yeah, why do you ask? Well, if you believe in God, why would you be afraid a lot? Somebody's lying. What is it? Which voice is it? See, the two can't fit in the same box, right? Big book says, men and women of faith have courage. They, the definition of courage is in the big book. I love it. They trust their God. They trust their God. It has nothing to do with belief. I trust my God. Bring it on. Bring it on. To me, whatever it is, nothing touches me but what God wants to touch me. Nothing, no one, nothing, no one, ever. Bring it on. What an incredible way to go through life. See? My God's about 30 feet tall. I got my little arm around his calf. Got his hand right in my head. Saying, I got you, boy. I got you covered. Go out and play in the playground. Boy, I go play. See? Come to places like this. Come up and stand in front. I don't, know what, I don't know what you need. I don't know what to talk about. I don't have to worry about it. Because I stand here and he just pats me in the head and says, okay, boy. <laughs> Stir them up a little bit. Got some old people down there resting on their ass too long. Stir their butts up a little bit. <laughs> Haven't written inventory in too long. Their goddamn sphincter muscles getting too tight. <laughs> Loosen them up a little bit. See? Have them write some inventory. Challenge them about prayer and meditation. Right? Have them get off their butt. Carry the message. Get excited about life again, right? Stir the pot a little. Whatever you say. Right? <laughs> See? Men of faith have courage. They trust their God. That's the kind of God I needed when I came in the rooms. See? That kind of a God. You write that fear inventory, and then right in the middle of that fear inventory, um, and, and I love this. This is another sentence, by the way. I think it'd be great for you guys to start talking about in, in meetings. But it, um, it talks about, I'm in the world to play the role that God has assigned. The extent as I do as I think God would have me and humbly rely on, does he enable me to match calamity with serenity? But it says I'd never apologize for depending upon my creator. I laugh at those who think spirit will share the weakness. Paradoxically, it's the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is faith means courage. All men and women of faith have courage, and they define it. They trust their God. I never apologize for God. Here's the sentence. Instead, I let God demonstrate through me what God can do. 
God can stay sober. God can, can stay sober through me. Can I keep myself sober? No. I drank for 20 years. I did dope for 13. Daily. Lots of it. I was a tornado. Period. On my power. But God can demonstrate through me staying clean and sober since October the 19th of 1982. Through me. Take an take a Iowa farm kid, travels all over the world talking about God in the steps. God can demonstrate through me what God can do. Open the first men's recovery center in the United States of America. First one ever. God can demonstrate through me what God can do. Powerful stuff. See? That's what this book's about. No, oh, just don't drink and go to meetings. No, no, no. <laughs> so much more. So much more. Whatever it is God wants you to do, in the world to play the role he has assigned. Maybe it's just to be an incredible husband. Or a father, or a wife, or a sister, or a friend. I don't know. You do the deal, you'll be shown, whatever it is. I suspect somewhere in the middle of it, though, you're probably supposed to be helping other Elkies. Right? See, I do a lot of stuff in the 11th step, but I never do it instead. God sent me to these rooms and said, I'm going to show you a path to have a revolutionary experience and come to know me in ways that you can't even believe. But I got a lot of work for you. Because you've got a lot of fellow sufferers out there, and you're the only one that can reach them because of your experience. Quick story on that. I, uh, some of you, maybe you've had this experience, but I, I have periods of time I get into some extreme spiritual intoxication. And uh, in one of those moments, it occurred to me I should maybe join a monastery. And uh, I had been seeking some counsel from a, a man who ran a monastery. He was both a, a priest and a, a monk. And so I went down to see him one time, and we sat down, we chatted for a while, and he had uh, he'd come back to Kerrville, Texas, where I was living at that time, and stayed there for about a week, and took him, I exposed him to some meetings and all those kinds of stuff. And now we get done, and he goes to me, uh, he said, uh, Mark, we really appreciate your efforts and your application to the monastery, but you just need to stay right where you are working with your kind. And I said, what do you mean, my kind? And he said, well, you know, you alcoholics and you drug addicts. He said, we don't do very well with you. But he, he said, uh, that, that place you go, and, and I've watched you, and you do really well with them, and they, that's where God needs you. So thanks for applying to the monastery, but we don't want you there. So, so that's probably always going to be a part of what I do. I'm going to be sitting down across from an alcoholic or drug addict trying to help them out to with, find their truth in the first step. And I've uh, been doing that for a lot of years, and, and I'll keep doing it. But I, I want to talk for a minute again about this, this deal about God. There's, there's a prayer. I ask him to remove my fear. and draw, He has tension. What do you have us be? I'm going to talk again briefly about this, this thing of fear because I, I think it's so instrumental in why sober we live miserable lives, why we don't reach for abundance, and I know it contributes to a lot of relapse. So outside of the obvious work in here, there's a couple other things about this I want to mention. Um, one is, let me ask this question. Well, are any of you, as you sit here right now in this moment, feeling fear? Any of you? Oh, some of you are. Okay. Let me ask this question of all of you who raised your hands. Are any of you in any concrete and immediate danger? Right now. Danger. Are you? Any of you? Okay. Then the fear is not real, is it? There's no reality to the fear except what your mind has given it. Now, I want you to think about something. From birth to death, most of your life, you could answer this question the way it was just answered. There's absolutely no reason to have the fear. It is manufactured by your mind. It is psychological in nature, and it is always about the future. Wouldn't it be that nice if it would be that easy to get rid of it? Is it that easy? Yes. Yes. 
if we have the capacity to live more in the present moment, the less we will experience fear. But you cannot do that if you're identified with its mind and its incessant chatter. And a lot of that chatter always has to do with the future. So very little of our life do we ever get to really be present. Unbeknownst to me, the, the disciplines of the 10th and 11th step thrust me into the present moment. Now, do I have to practice staying present? Yes. Craig and I were laughing today. We know ourselves too well. We have fun with ourselves. Now, we aren't leaving until tomorrow morning. We got packed today. <laughs> See, I know him. He was trying to pretend he was really in the moment. And he was going to do it in the morning. And I go, yeah, you betcha. Comes out about 1 o'clock this afternoon. Yeah, you're right. I'm packed. Right? So, see, we realize that it's going to be there. Right? So we practice. Practice. Come back. How? Grab this. Breathe. Anything. Come back to here. Be here. Be here. Be with you. Be present to where I am. The only place I can meet God. The only reality of my life. There's no other place to meet God. You don't meet God down here or back here. Now, within this breath, this context, is the only place I can come to know God. There is no other place. Oh, okay. Because the 10th and 11th step, if you look at what the 10th and 11th step really ask you to do, the strict spiritual disciplines of those steps, and they are strict. If you don't believe me, you take him to, <laughs> take him to some man of the cloth sometime. And say, by the way, I'd like you to read about the 10th and 11th step and tell me what you think. Most of them would say, if my congregation did that, they'd be close to enlightenment. Why? Because it does. It tells us every morning, do all these prayers, meditate. Do all this stuff during the day, and then at nighttime, do an evening review, answer all these questions, do more prayer and more meditation, and do that every day till you die. <laughs> and then, then here's what's funny. In AA meetings, heaven forbid you ever mention the word religious, right? We have one of the most religious, dogmatic practices there is. Matter of fact, what most religions ask of their congregation is simple compared to what this asks of me. Right? Make amends, clean it all up, pay all the money back. I'm sponsored a guy one time, right? I'll never forget this. We get to the amends process. And good, good pal of mine. And uh, name is Floyd. And uh, we uh, get to talking about some monies. And as it turned out, um, it was probably almost $40,000. And we got to talking about this, and uh, it was very clear to me, and according to the big book, that he needed to pay this money back. So I could tell he's getting a little angry. And I said, uh, Floyd, what are you getting angry about? Floyd came to me a believer. Matter of fact, his church sent him to AA. Uh, you know you're drinking a little bit too much then. But uh, <laughs> we can't help you, but you're a good deacon. Keep giving us your money. You go to those rooms. So at any rate, we get to this man's. Anyhow, he starts to get angry. And I said, what are you getting angry about? And he goes, well, he said, the church said I didn't have to pay it back. All I had to do was pray for forgiveness. And I said, yeah, and the church sent you to AA to get sober. Big book says you need to pay it back, you know. So he often jokes about that. AA was the most expensive place he had ever been sent to. And he said, it's supposed to be free, right? What, it wasn't free. He did pay the money back, by the way. Yeah, still sober to this day. Um, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, I went up to the uh, fifth step last night. A, a couple things I mentioned to some of you is the idea of doing uh, multiple fifth steps in which you take a uh, body of inventory and read it to two, three, four, five people. Uh, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, it will also really help you p get pulled away from your ego. So maybe read to your sponsor, read to a couple of your protégés, those kinds of things. So I know when I uh, get back, probably over a two-week time period, uh, I probably will read inventory five times. I'll read to Craig, two other people I sponsor, and two elders in Austin, Texas. The more people you read to, the less attachment you have to the ego. You get pulled back. By the way, when I read inventory, I follow the instructions in the book. I've got to find somebody who will understand and approve what I'm driving at. I need to find somebody who understands that it's life and death. 
I need, I need to read inventory to someone who's a lot more concerned about my life than how they feel about what they say to me. See, when I'm reading the fifth step, I'm fighting for my life. I'm up against my ego. My ego is going to do everything in the world to justify, to minimize, to rationalize these resentments, these fears, these sexual and or personal relationships. Constantly living in that state of they're more at fault, right? It's like the guy said to me one time, well, in that relationship with that guy, 90% of the time he was at fault. And I said, well, why don't you just claim 100% of your 10 then? <laughs> Where are you going to go with that one, right? So those are some of the things that I, that I look for when, uh, when I'm looking for people to read to. And uh, I have read to women. Great, gives you a whole great perspective. Read to, read to young, read to old. I've read to uh, men of the cloth. So, but I, I find it, it's a uh, fascinating experience. Normally, every time I get ready to read, I review the instructions from page 70 to 75 so that I stay clear of what I'm about to do. I'm about to face and be rid of that which has me blocked from power I need. I'm about to look at the exact nature of my defects as a result of attempting to li live my life based on self-will. But that's what the whole purpose of this is about. It's not about anything else. It's not about I'm trying to win an award for being a neat guy. It's that I'm blocked from power. And I need to get rid of that which has me blocked from power. So I read the inventory. And you get done with the inventory, and then you have the incredible fifth step promises. And then I wanted to talk a minute to me, there's spiritual virtue and fallen instructions. When I'm done reading inventory, then I go home and the book says I need to find a place where I'm be quiet for an hour. So I take a timer and I set it for 60 minutes. And I click it. Now it says I'm going to carefully review what I have done. So I like to close my eyes and review in a general way this inventory that I just read. Now there's a prayer in here. It says, I need to thank God from the bottom of my heart that I know God better. Now, I don't know if any of you ever thought about this, but how can I know God better as a result of reading this dismal, infantile inventory? How does that happen? Why would I? Because I, I, got, I got this kind of mind. It's like, oh, wait a minute. Why do I know God better as a result of reading that inventory? I'll leave you all to ponder that. It's a great question, isn't it? Why would I know God better as a result of reading a resentment inventory, a fear inventory, and a sex and or personal relationships inventory? Why? Why would I experience all those incredible fifth-step promises? Now, some of this I want to throw out to those of you who haven't written in a while or struggle with writing inventory. If you had a clear idea of what could happen on the other side of inventory, you wouldn't bulk at inventory. It's kind of like trading in a new car every year or something. I don't know. Great stuff. Right? And it goes on and it says, taking the book down from the shelf, I turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. I carefully read the first five proposals. I ask if I've omitted anything. So I read each question. I sit with it. Powerless over alcohol. My life's in management. Boom, sit with it. Came to believe that a power greater than myself. And you go through it in that fashion. I'm building an arch through which I walk a free man at last. They refer to this construction site stuff with some frequency in here, in particular in the fifth step. It goes on and says, is my work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? I don't know if a lot of times I, I take people through and we get to this and they've been around the program for a while and this question about the stones. I don't know if you know this, but earlier on the big book told me that the second step was the cornerstone and the third step is the keystone. And if you don't know that and it asks you that question, you'll just go, well, I don't know what that means, but I got too much pride to ask anyone. I'm just going to move right on past. Right? How many of you have been sober for a while and, and, and didn't know what the stones were? Or the stones properly in place? Right? The stones for what? 
to build a spiritual arch through which you walk a free man and a free woman. The last stone in place is the 12th step. That's why. To be entirely rid of self, ladies and gentlemen. To walk through that archway, right? Are the stones properly in place? Have I skipped on the cement put into the foundation? My first step, do I know what's wrong with me? Have I tried to make mortar without sand? All kinds of construction questions. On page 75, I thought it was about not drinking. They're building houses, for God's sakes, right? See? Timer goes off. I finish the hour. Boom. Turn to sixth step. How do you know when you're ready for the sixth step? When the timer goes off and you're done with the hour. That's how. Real complex stuff, you know. If I can answer to my satisfaction all those questions, I then look at step six. I've emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Now, this next question is the only kind of only an alcoholic drug addict would ask this question. You've looked at all this material. You've read these inventories. You've read all this. You, you understand by then selfishness is your problem. It's the reason you drink, do dope, etc., etc. Now, here's a question. We've got, we've got to sit with it. It's kind of like the question, do you want to die an alcoholic death or live on a spiritual basis? And we go, well, could you elaborate on what dying an alcoholic death means, right? But here's the question. Am I now ready to let God remove from me all the things I've admitted are objection? We've got to sit with that? See, God's funny. Think about this. He, he took a tribe of people that were so asleep we think we're God, right? So it's like, I can just see him. He's talking, he's talking to St. Peter and he goes, well, we're going to have to trick him. He said, here's what we'll do. In the second step... First of all, we'll convince them they need power. The second step, we'll let them invent us. It says, come up with your own concept, right? They can invent us. Hell, we don't care. It's obvious everything else we put down there don't work with them anyhow. So they'll come up with their own concept, right? They get to invent me. Then in the third step, we're going to let them make a decision to turn their will knife over to that which created their will knife. Right? Do you get that? I'm going to make a decision. Let my mom and dad be my mom and dad. Right? I mean, think about it, the third step. I'm going to make a decision to turn my will and life over to God as I understand God. Well, what created your will and life? Well, God did. Right? You see? But then, here we go. We're back to six. Well, remember who we're dealing with. So even though they've seen all this, we've got to let them think they have a choice. Right? So you have a long list of all these defects of character, which lead to you drinking, winding up where you wind up. Am I ready to let God remove these things that I have admitted are objectionable? Oh, and this next one's even greater. It's a question of faith. Can he now take them all, every one, right? We still cling to something we'll not let go. We ask God to help us be willing. I was asked earlier, uh, the most effective tool I've found for step six uh, is a tool I call the sacraments of penance. Big book talks about identifying the exact nature of defects. So I have spent time looking for the most effective tools I could find. And that, outside of some of the religious stuff in there, is the best tool I've ever found to identify my defects of character in ways that what it does, it takes the seven deadly sins and really embellishes them, right? Now, it's a tool of the Catholic Church, but don't ask Catholics because they don't use it. I'm serious, but it's a great tool. I've been using it for years. I had my first profound experience using this tool. What I do when I get done reading inventory is it's about seven or eight pages long, and I just go down the list. It starts like pride, putting self in the place of God. And then I pronounce myself guilty or not guilty. 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 <laughs> and and it, it just, oh, God, it's got incredible stuff like, like, um, uh, under, uh, oh, gossip. Uh, it's, it's fabulous. They talk about retailing gossip. I mean, it's almost like you set up a store and sell it. You know, you just, uh, but I, till I did the sacraments of penance, I thought I kind of had my act together. I've never thought that since then. You know, I, it, oh, I love it. Murder in deed or thought. Oh, no. Right, you know. 
you just you, you go through and you think you're really doing well. You know, you you think you're being kind, and then this stuff comes up. You know, retailing of gossip and uh, and and well, I tell you the profound experience I finally had with the sixth step, because I, I picked this tool up when I was 12 or 13 years sober, was when I got done with this six or seven pages long. I was going to do a marker because I didn't think there'd be very many. Yeah, I may as well just dip the damn thing in yellow, and uh, so at that time, you know, I. I really, I had a deep inner conviction of how much I love God and I'm trying to do the right thing. And I got seven pages and they're all highlighted, right? And, and I'm, I'm sitting there and, and like I'm, I'm meditating and, and I'm asking God to remove this. And, and I just literally broke down. And I'll tell you why I broke down is I really thought I'd been doing okay. <laughs> and then I saw how much I fell short. And then I realized, so do you. And that's the best we can do. And you know what? It's okay. It's okay for you, and it's okay for me. And, man, I got it. I, it was okay for me to just to be Mark Houston that day. There's no, nothing to arrive at. Uh, you know, as, as good as I wanted to get, man, I fall short. And it ain't going to get any better than that, right? I don't expect to get enlightened while I'm here. It's just I fall short too much. I stumble. I hit my knees. And so do you, and in the middle of that, you and I got very equal. There was none of this up here and down here and that kind of stuff. And then not too long after that experience, this same man who said, I don't want you in the monastery, I want you out there working with your people, um, he was sitting there in his own way, was doing his own sacrament and spending his thing, and he breaks down crying. Now, this is a guy that he lives in a monastery. He prays six times a day, starting at 3 a.m. in the morning. He's devoted his life to prayer. And meditation, and he's sitting there weeping because he falls so short. And and I'm and, and I'm watching this, and I'm having this experience with him. And that was my first profound effect with the six step and defects of character, and seeing why I need to come back to God, and seeing that I fall short, seeing there's no arrival place, seeing the necessity of prayer, of meditation, of forgiveness, all of those kinds of things, and getting on an equal footing with you. Realizing how most of those defects, uh, the firing mechanism for them is fear. The major firing mechanism, if you just work with the big big seven, pride, greed, lust, anger, sloth, gluttony, etc. Fear is the firing mechanism for my defects of character. And the less fear that I'm in, the less I exhibit those. So, that's a tool. Um, any of you interested in getting a copy of that, I've got plenty of business cards with an email. I'll be happy to send it to you if you want it. Seventh step, simple prayer. God take all of me, good and bad. Right? Okay. Eighth step. I believe the eighth and ninth step have a tremendous amount to do based on what your sponsors have done with the eighth and ninth step. Here's what I mean by that. If you think about this, everybody in this room, our lineage could be traced back to Bill and Bob, correct? Everyone in the room. Don P. carried the message to me. He was sponsored by a man named Gary B. Gary B., I spent a little time with him last summer. Gary's 42, 43 years sober, lives in Indianapolis. His sponsor is a man named Paul M. Paul M. sobered up August 15, 1947. Paul M. had a personal experience with Dr. Bob and a girl, guy named Earl T. in Chicago. Paul lives in Chicago. So the message that got transmitted to me doesn't have a whole lot of BS between it, does it? So when it came time to, to make amends, the most important word in the eighth step to my lineage was made a list of all persons we had harmed and came willing to make amends to them all. All meant just that. I had to go back as far as I could remember to grade school. And I had to write down everything I ever stole that I could remember and every dime I ever, all of it. All of it. Long, long list. See, you're influenced by what you're influenced by. Get done with a list, six or seven pages of very clear instructions on how to make amends, how to make the approach. Took me 70 off that first inventory. 
Took me 17 years to complete those amends. I completed every single amend that I had a conscious awareness of. I paid every dime of the money back. I went to nine different states. You want what I have, you do what I do. Okay. How free do you want to be? How much of God do you want to know? I don't know. Pay all the money back. Okay. Go clean it up. I went to grave sites. Back into high school. Teachers. Ex-wives. Employers. Offered a amazing, just amazing stuff. All over. Alaska. Oregon. Washington. California. South Dakota cleaned it up. It is difficult for me to describe what it was like the day that I made the last amend that was in my state of consciousness. Here's the other piece that happened to me. I think that day, why I look at the big book and its promises, ninth step, is that day I lost my fear of dying. If you lose your fear of dying, you have no fear of living. You live with complete abandon. What a difference. That's why I like to stay current. See, if I died today, my slate's clean. As far as I know, ladies and gentlemen, I resubmit to the first nine steps. I want to keep it clean. Now, there's a theory don't know if this is true. Some people like the idea of there's reincarnation. I don't know about that. It's kind of like a priest one day. He was telling me what he thought was going to happen to me when I died, and I asked him if he had any experience with that. <laughs> and he said no, and I said, I'm not interested in your opinion. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm an experienced kind of guy. But in the event that there's such a thing as reincarnation, part of that whole theory is the way you left is the way you come back. So in the event that that may be true, my slate is clean. <laughs> I love my tribe, but God damn, this has been a tough life at times, right? I'd like to come back just, I don't know, maybe live in the same town my whole life or something. You know, marry once instead of four times, you know, just different things. Who knows? But that ninth step will thrust me into the tenth step. And I want to talk a little bit about 10 or 11. And I could go on. I could spend a whole weekend on the ninth step. But the instructions there are fairly clear. I want to talk some more about some of the stuff that happens when we hit this tenth step. There are how many paragraphs? Let's see. One, two, three. Four paragraphs in the tenth step. Very seldom do we ever talk about the, the last two. But, and visualizations help for me. So I, I'm going to do this with you. It talks about we've entered the world of the spirit by the time you get to the tenth step. It starts out like this. It says, this thought. What thought? The thought of finishing your amends. brings us to step 10, which suggests that we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. So the day I start making amends is the day I start working with the disciplines of the 10th step, if you believe the instructions of the book. It says, I vigorously commenced this way of living as I cleaned up my past. Next sentence. We have entered the world of the spirit. Why aren't we talking about that sentence in meetings? We've entered the world of the spirit. What does that mean? This is my experience. You do the work in the first nine steps. Earlier, we were told the only reason we're going to write inventory is to face and be rid of that which has us blocked from God. God lies deep down within. We're blocked. We do the work in four through nine. We are not blocked. That's why you have all those incredible fifth-step promises. And by the time you get to the ninth step, you've entered the world of the Spirit. What does that mean? It means that which was blocking you before from the Spirit housed within here is now gone. You have entered the world of the Spirit. You now have an awakened spirit. 
you now have a new sixth sense. And by the way, 10 and 11 allow you to continue to have this awareness. You don't do 10 and 11, all that work you did to face and be rid of that which has you blocked, that wall starts coming back again. Pretty soon, you're up against yourself, feeling separated from, and you've lost contact with the fact that you got a spirit housed in here. That's why I keep doing 10 and 11. So I've entered the world of the spirit. Think of it as this way. Think of it as though we, we've stepped into a room, right? And this language, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the 10th and 11th step is new language. It's not language to appeal to your cognitive mind. It is language of the spirit. It's a whole different language. It's saying my next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness using your awakened spirit. Go here, do this, boom. You see what I'm saying? I mean, look at the series of events that took place to have all us here this evening. He, 97 travel agents couldn't have made this happen. <laughs> Every one of us in our own way had an awakened spirit that responded to us being here. I mean, I love it down here, but I had other things to do. So do you. But there was a part of us that responded, and we're all here. That's what that's about goes on to say, we're, we're here to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. And then it talks about, with your awakened spirit, continue to watch. What? Watch yourself. For what? Selfishness, dishonest, resentment, and fear. You're observing yourself, right? When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately, make amends quickly. Then we resolutely turn. Spiritual practices. Turn is the spiritual practice. Turn out of yourself. Turn away from yourself. Turn to someone you can help. Love and tolerance of others is your code. Now, here's these incredible 10-step promises that can only manifest through an awakened spirit. Love and tolerance of others is my code. You can't practice that with self-will intact. It's impossible. How about this? I've ceased fighting anything or anyone, dash, even alcohol. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine living that on a daily basis? Ceased fighting? What does that mean? It means I've ceased fighting. <laughs> Traffic? Lines? Angry people? Ceased fighting. She wants to stay. She wants to go. The health comes. The health goes. Ceased fighting. That's exactly what it means. And it says even alcohol. Why? Because for this time, sanity will have returned. They flip us back into liquor. I'll seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, I recoil from liquor as though from a hot flame. I react samely and normally, and this happens automatically. My new attitude toward liquor is given me with no thought or effort on my part. It just comes. That's the miracle of it. I'm not fighting, nor am I avoiding temptation. Check this out. As a result of this work, I've been placed in a position of neutrality. I am safe and protected. Bring it on. Right? I am safe and protected. I don't want to, geez, I wonder if they got liquor there. I don't care. I'm in a position of neutrality. I've been restored to sanity. Would you like a drink? No, you don't have enough. <laughs> you know? Would you like a drink? Only if you want me sleeping with your wife. You don't know. See, I'm saying I've been restored to sanity. I'm in a position of neutrality. It says the problem's been removed. What problem? The obsession of the mind, the spirituality. That problem. It said it's been removed. It does not exist. I'm neither cocky nor am I afraid. That is my experience. Is it your experience? This is how I react. Pay attention. As long as I keep in fit spiritual condition. Doesn't say anything in there about God, does it? Fit, spiritual condition. That's how I react. Position of neutrality. Cease fighting anything or anyone. Love and talents of others. If I do what? Stay in fit, spiritual condition. How do you do that? Well, they're going to tell us. We're not going to like it because it means we've got to do a little work. Easy to let up in the spiritual program of action rest on laurels. Headed for trouble if we do. Why? Alcohol is a subtle foe. We're not cured of alcoholism. I'm given a daily reprieve. See, this is where God gets even. 
says, I'm going to let them invent me because they're so arrogant, nothing else will work. I'm going to let them make a decision to turn their will and life over to that which created their will and life. They'll get that. Then because they're God and they're judgmental, they're going to write these inventories because everyone else is always to blame because they won't do what they want because they like to play God. Then they're going to read it to someone. They're going to defile these defects of character. Then they're going to ask me to take them. Then they're going to go out and make amends. And now it's payback time. Because in order to stay sober and realize all this neat stuff, there's all kinds of stuff they got to do on a daily basis. (laughs) Right? (laughs) And they start to talk about what it is. We're given a daily reprieve contingent of the maintenance of spiritual condition. Every day is a day when these people must carry the vision of God's will in all our activities. Say a prayer. How can I best serve thee? Thy will not mine be done. That's a practice. You get up in the morning before you go into work. Sit down at your desk. Say that prayer. You work for an hour. You get ready to move to another activity. How can I best serve thee? Thy will not mine be done. Move over here. It's a practice. Tenth and eleventh step are practices, ladies and gentlemen. You could do them the rest of your life. Turn is a practice. Pause is a practice. Ask is a practice. These are incredible things that you and I get to work with during the course of a day in all the areas of my life. It says, these are thoughts which must go with me constantly. I can exercise my willpower along this line. All I wish is the proper use of the will. The 10th step is about the line of the will. I want you to think about this. You did your evening review. Your little sunbeam for God. You went to bed and slept great. Little eyeballs pop open, right? Little committee starts talking. You make your coffee. You sit down. On awakening, we consider our plans for the day. And then you start saying your prayers and doing your stuff, and you meditate. You're hooked up. Line of the will, right? Now, you walk out to your door. Put the hand in the door. There's going to be someone in the parking lot blocking my car. You're already a little off the line. <laughs> right? Thy will be done. Boom, back. Get in. Go into Starbucks. Three cars in front of you. Boom! Way over here. What are they doing? It's too early in the morning. Right? Thy will not mind be done. Boom, back. Line of the will all day long, right? You get a phone call. Put you in tons of fear. Wow, way over here. Right? God, remove fear. How many rhyme would you be? Boom. Nope, didn't quite make it. Do it again. God, remove the fear. What'd you help me be? Boom, I'm back. Now imagine you're not doing any of this. By the time you come to the meeting I'm at, your ass is like this. And you want to talk about self-pity. And it's God's fault. He gave you 10-step practices all day long. Line to the will. Boom. Back. Back. Ass. Pause. Turn. Cease fighting. Wow. Powerful, powerful stuff. Imagine if you're not doing any of these practices. One day goes by. Two days. Nine days. That's when you pick up the paper and go, well, it says in the paper that Brad picked up a machine gun, killed nine people. Just don't drink go to meetings. Do you understand the point? You see what you see how far off you get? See, I, I don't have the luxury of doing this stuff. See, I do the 11 step in the morning, get hooked up. Got your plants, got your cats, whatever. You get all hooked up. You put your hand in that door, it's on. You're out there. That's where the 10 step, pause, ask, turn, cease, right? Great stuff to bring you back. Sixth sense, right? Stay hooked up. Many times throughout the day, that will be done. You do this all day long. Then you go home at night, you open your book, you do all the evening review questions. To do what? To see if you're awake during the day. To be able to get a decent night's sleep. To see if there's any corrective action. I told you, God gets even. (laughs) Right? There's no rest for us once we get to 10 to 11. There's just not. Then you get up the next morning, consider the plans for the day, and sometimes that's carrying over corrective action. You see how powerful this stuff is, though. You see, the 10th and 11th step to me are an abyss. There's no end to the practices that you can do with them. It makes you more effective in every grow in understanding and effectiveness, right? But powerful, powerful stuff. 12th step takes care of itself, as it has was evidenced by all of us been here. Uh, a couple of things, and then I'm going to close it up. Um, To me, one through nine are a series of steps to allow me to experience the spiritual dimension of the 10th and 11th step. And then allow me to take that 
awakened spirit out into this world to grow in understanding and effectiveness in every area of my life, every single area of my life, to live an abundant life beyond my wildest dreams. Along the way, practice some of the principles that we've been taught about. But see, what, what a deal. What, I, think, I think we all have an obligation to take that new alcoholic, to take that new addict and talk to him about this God. See? To talk to them about this power that can come into their lives, how it can change and transform their lives. That they can get taken places beyond their wildest dreams if they want to. Remember? See, I work off spiritual consent. Craig, anyone I work with, Brad, they've given me spiritual consent in their life. If you haven't given me spiritual consent, I'll never say a word to you about how you're living your life. If you give me spiritual consent, and I, and I, ha I have given spiritual consent to all kinds of people, in which I give them consent to say to me, you're just a little off the beam there. You're getting ready to mix the Kool-Aid, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm the kind of guy, you give me enough space, I'd be like David Koresh. We're holding up, we ain't coming out. <laughs> Going to rewrite the big book, you know, with the best of intentions. See, so you got a spiritual consent. Boom, get some people. They pull you back on track. But don't miss out on this. God bless you all. I love you.